So good morning and welcome to the standing committee meeting for Wednesday, August 29th, 2023. All council meetings will continue to be live streamed on the city's website. Our first order of business is roll call. Would the clerk please take the roll? Reverend Burgess. Mr. Coghill. Ms. Gross. Mr. Krause. Here. Mrs. Kill Smith. Mrs. Strasberger. Here. Mrs. Warwick. Here. Mr. Wilson. Here. Mr. Lavelle Chair. Here. Five members present. Our next order of business is roll call, and I would like to remind all speakers that the, I'm sorry. <laughs> Our next order of business is public comment. And I would like to remind all speakers of the rules of council state that comments are limited to matters of concern, official action, or deliberation, which are or may be before city council and profanity will not be permitted. After you are called, please restate your name, provide your neighborhood for the record. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Our first registered speaker is Dr. Ronald Lynn Miller, whom I do not see with us. Uh -huh. Our next registered speaker is Naomi Mullen. Here, 83 Jesus. not shady deals in Von Air. First, do no harm is not just the role of medicine. Government shall not harm the people or can be held accountable. What busting and infliction of emotional distress has occurred against Von Air. Those who oppose property owners of Von Air do so at their own peril. Politicians and municipal employees are public servants. My husband was a dedicated model employee that should be emulated by others. The Public School Board of Education in Pittsburgh has zero regard for the rights of the property owners, taxpayers, citizens, and voters in the Bonaire community. We do not consent to the detrimental school building remaining in our community. We do not what we do want is a green space to replace the building and improve the location. This is the least that can be done to repair the loss that has occurred. The public servants of the school board shall work with the community to the best of their ability. It was fraudulent to claim that the community approved apartments. The school board has proven itself as detrimental. Will you be part of the solution? Thank you, Dr. Miller, for promoting global intelligence, not global governance. Stop the who.com, screw the who.com, say no to the who in any case. Follow real science and not bought and paid for propaganda. On June 20th, 2022, the detrimental Bonaire school building worsened into becoming a disruptive and nuisance property. We have objected to apartments or anything other than a green space to replace the school, tear it down. The building is a magnet to youth who broke in. In addition to trespassing, three of the three of the seven had to be escorted out of the building, tear it down. Other neighborhoods have been blighted with worse. Do not allow it to happen to on air. The outcry to the school board has proven futile. Put pressure on them to sell it to the city for a dollar, tear it down. Now that McKinley Park is no longer in on air, we want the school to become a green space as replacement. Open deals, not shady deals in Bonaire. The waste, fraud, and abuse of school tax resources is tremendous regarding the long closed school. Even current PPS employees have said the solution is to tear the building down and create a green space. Shady trees, not shady deals in Bonaire. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registered speaker is Lee Hart. Is Lee Hart with us? If not, our next registered speaker is Carol Whaley. I see you online. I'm here. My name is Carol Whaley and I have lived in Lawrenceville for 18 years. I have worked in the animal protection sector for the past 20 years. I am speaking today to express my strong opposition to Bill 2023-1845, which proposes an ordinance to amend the Pittsburgh Code of Ordinances to allow for the implementation of a deer calling program within the city's parks. Advocates have been discussing deer population management for years with the city without any actionable steps being taken. Why now has this administration introduced legislation with such urgency? Such urgency that council was asked to circumvent the normal legislative process with a waiver of council rule eight. 
Specifically, Council Rule 8 states that all bills must have accompanying documentation as to purpose, history, and fiscal impact in a manner prescribed by ordinance, the Council Budget Office, and the President of Council. The Clerk shall refer such bill for the proper committee, which committee may not consider such bill until the 8th calendar day following the meeting in which the bill is introduced. And standing committees may not consider any bill until the 8th calendar day following the meeting in which the bill is introduced. Where is the transparency in this process? Where is the strategic long-term plan for the management of the deer? How will the city measure the success of the program? What even has the city identified as the issues which need to be mitigated? What is the urgency on this matter? What are the ramifications to public health that necessitate a waiver to Rule 8 to call deer? While I understand the concerns outlined in the bill, I believe neither killing nor sterilizing deer is the appropriate solution to address these issues. The implementation of a deer calling program raises ethical and environmental concerns and should not be a default solution. The proposal to discharge firearms, air guns, and arrows in our parks contradicts the principles of conservation and nonviolence that should guide our interactions with wildlife and public spaces. If we are, as Mayor Ganey says, a community, why have we, the residents and park goers, been given little opportunity to voice our interest in this matter? Public opinion should be a significant factor in decisions related to the management of our city's parks and wildlife. As responsible and compassionate citizens, we have a duty to protect and preserve our natural heritage for future generations. I encourage the council to engage in transparent and inclusive discussions with community members, wildlife experts, and environmental organizations to explore sustainable and humane solutions that prioritize both human and ecological well-being. In conclusion, I implore the council to reconsider the proposed deer calling program outlined in Bill 2023-1845. Let us Thank you. Our next registered speaker is John Griffin. Is there a John Griffin with us? If not, our next registered speaker is Christina Graziano. She's online. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Christine Graziano. I'm a resident of Squirrel Hill North on a street close to Shenley Park where we own an acre of land, half of which is in Woodland Slope, and where deer roam freely down the streets, sidewalks, and driveways in search of food spilling out from the parks where they have eaten through the understory and continue to grow their numbers. I'm writing to encourage you to pass the ordinance code change and contract before you today that would allow for proper deer management in our city parks. As a former nine-year board member of Allegheny Land Trust and founder of a nonprofit organization originally focused on planting trees for community health and as well a property owner of wooded land, I can tell you firsthand how humane and responsible these actions would be at this time. Unmanaged deer populations are decimating our ecosystems and the consequences are catalytic, setting in motion the removal of understory, which leaves soil susceptible to erosion, which leads to water quality decline, the soil exposure further destabilizes the ground plane, especially on slopes, and the larger tree canopy trees have less to anchor them in the ground, leading to mature, decline, tree, mature tree decline, death, and landslides. There are meaningful impacts happening now with meaningful economic consequences and climate consequences. Landslides destroy property and are expensive. Water pollution remedies are expensive. Losing big trees when we need carbon sinks for CO2 capture is catastrophic. As an organization planting trees, I saw the irony and ridiculousness of planting in these environments firsthand. Massive resources being put toward tree planting with tree shelters to keep deer off them, which only increased the carbon footprint of the act of planting itself, and with less than ideal results. Without getting to the heart of the problems, the efforts felt like running up a downhill escalator. Last night, the county voted to develop a climate action plan one of the most impactful things you can do right now for the climate and our resilience to climate change is to set the stage for healthy ecosystem revitalization and manage the deer populations properly. I love animals, I love deer, but our systems are out of balance. 
There are no predators and they are growing thin and mangy as they desperately roam the city for any scrap of vegetation they can reach simply because there are too many of them. We can fix the other structural problems later that take longer, I hope, creating wildlife corridors and less fragmented landscapes, building more densely and reintroducing predators in appropriate places. But we must act now. We cannot lose our forests. On a few of the ALT properties, deer management is encouraged with bow hunters. The results are truly noticeable. There is a healthy understory, diversity, native plants, and the deer that you do see are healthy. If you haven't visited properties or areas with and without deer management, please do so and see with your own eyes. It makes a difference in quality of life for all creatures. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zachary Delaney. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Zach Delaney. I live in East Liberty. Uh, I have a master's in sustainability from Chatham University and a bachelor's in environmental studies from the University of Pittsburgh. I am not an expert, but I have learned from those who are, and I've also studied the ecology and resource management of local areas, such as the Hazelwood Greenway, where I discussed deer management and forest succession alongside issues with water flow and erosion. Today, I'm speaking strongly in favor of enacting a deer calling plan that is enacted by verified expert archers from elevated perches, which has arguably been needed for decades. Deer are a vector for ticks and disease, and their impact on native ecosystems is seriously destructive at their current numbers. It is estimated deer density might be 50 deer per square mile of green space, where at appropriate populations there might only be 50 deer total across our parks. It has been demonstrated numerous times that deer stop the growth and recovery of native ecosystems significantly through their browsing, and deer are generalists, which means that they will eat almost anything native, including toxic plants, and are capable of thriving and, and exploiting the humid environments to grow their populations dramatically. Saplings, shrubs, fruiting and flowering species, and even grasses and woody shoots can all fall to the overbrowsing by deer, depending on their population size. And when mature trees fall in space and the canopy opens, deer browsing will halt the process of natural forest succession, preventing new trees from establishing. When this occurs, it leads behind an evenly aged mature forest with few, if any, sprouting native species. And by consequence, invasive species that deer don't like to eat, like the Japanese barberry, Japanese knotweed, garlic mustard, and others take hold of the understory, while vines grow on the mature trees that remain. Deer leave behind a legacy that reduces the long-term seed presence in forests, meaning that even when the deer are eradicated, additional investment and care must be taken to rebuild the forest. We must consider deer culling as an opportunity to improve the city's green spaces by, by allowing natural succession to occur, which will encourage healthy native species survival rather than toxic or invasive ones. Forests can regain the ability to host diverse root structures and brush, which will improve soil retention and decrease the intensity of water-driven erosion. Additionally, as has been widely mentioned, a reduction in deer population means a reduction in vehicular accidents, which presently kills and maims a significant number of deer annually. Again, I believe that we should move forward with the deer calling program. I hope to see it succeed immediately, and I hope that it can be followed by the introduction of resilient, diverse, and fast-growing native species that can reclaim the forest floor and restore natural succession. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Cafaios. I did see you come off of mute, but we cannot hear you if you're speaking. Not sure why we can't hear her, but we'll come back. Let's move on to Susan Johnson. Please come to the mic, provide your name, neighborhood. You'll be given three minutes. <clears throat> My name is Susan Johnston. I live in Regent Square on LeClaire, right next to Frick. Um, this was a planned crisis. For several years, the Game Commission in 2B, our wildlife area, has cut doe permits by the thousands. For example, in 2019 to 2020, it was cut by 2,000. In 2020 to 2021, it was cut by 5,000. At that point, the commission decided the deer population in 2B was stable, no, no efforts to curb the population were made. 
These are the people you're putting in charge of controlling the population in Frick, the people whose job it is to maximize hunting opportunities in the state and whose funding comes from hunting licenses. Urban hunting and Frick Park in particular are crown jewels, and they're going to make sure the population in Frick is high enough to always need hunting. Our in one indicator that they are not serious about population control is if they allow bucks to be killed in these hunts. Bucks are placeholders who will not reproduce. Killing them and opening up space for does that will reproduce will cause more of a problem. The problem will never go away by design. Second, deer do not carry Lyme disease. <laughs> Mice, chipmunks, and other rodents do. In fact, these, there's study, here's one study, one of many. White-tailed deer serum kills the Lyme disease spirochete. It actually kills the Lyme disease spirochete. This is in Vector-Borne and Zoonotic Diseases, Volume 23, Number 5, 2023. <clears throat> um, they're going to feed off things that do have Lyme disease um, in their blood and, and potentially infect more ticks and make the problem worse. Third, the complaints that deer are destroying ecosystems in the park ring hollow when you allow unmitigated clearing and destruction from mountain bike creation. They're, these are more destructive to habitat than deer and disrupt nesting and new areas whenever they're opened up. One former park official told me that the trails were to blame for the erosion, particularly the Braddock Trail. Finally, this is going to be a bloody horror show. Bow hunting is not the way to do this. It's going to there are going to be injured and dying deer coming up in our neighborhoods and our yards, sometimes for days it takes for these animals to die. Ultimately, they're going to be shot. The people who are pushing this, some of whom I know, are not going to be there. They'll be gone. The people who have to show up for work or who have family obligations are going to see this in their yards. I urge you, please do not do this. If you do do it, make sure there are no bucks killed and make sure this is done in the most humane way possible. Thank you. Thank you. I will go back to Lee Hart. Has Lee Hart joined us? If not, has John Griffin joined us? If not, let's try Catherine once again. You're currently muted. You're still on mute. With that, she may not want to speak. Are there anyone else? We've exhausted our list of registered speakers. Is there anyone in chambers wishing to speak? If so, please come forward at this time. Provide your name, neighborhood. You'll be given three minutes to speak. Last call for anyone in chambers. If not, that moves us on to our standing committee agenda. Our first committee of the day is finance and law, which is chaired by myself. We have our one deferred paper bill 1752. I'll ask for a member to make a motion to hold for two weeks where we're still, it's still being worked on. Bill 1752, ordinance amending the city of Pittsburgh code of ordinances, city of Pittsburgh service workers, prevailing wage ordinance, title one administrative, article seven procedures, chapter 161 contracts by supplementing section 161.38. Motion hold two weeks, please. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Firms of recommendation. Bill be held two weeks. That takes us to our new paper, Bill 1833. Bill 1833, resolution authorizing the issuance of a warrant in favor of Brennan Thrower in an amount not to exceed $18,000 and no cents in full and final settlement of a discharge grievance. Motion hold for executive session, please. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Bill be held for executive session. Need a motion to approve the invoices. So moved. Very brief discussion, please. Second. Discussion, Councilman Cross. Solicitor, you, 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 would you come up for a second, please? You're generally really good about this. I know we have a, a, a unusual number of ordinary or of, um, of, uh, why did I lose the word? In invoices. Invoices, thank you. Uh, because we were on recess, but generally speaking, I've reviewed, you've reviewed, and you're comfortable. It, there, we, need to, we do need to weigh the rules. We do? For four items. Let's do that then, uh, Mr. Chair. Will you lead yes. us through that? Sure. Um, we need to waive the rules for Civic Plus, um, which supports our code of ordinances. And all of these are because it's been four weeks 
that we haven't approved the invoices while they're over the amount. Um, but Civic Plus is an amount of 6260 um, for our municipal code electronic updates. We need to waive the rules for dollar rent a car, which our police use for undercover vehicles, and that total is $8,382. We need to waive the rules for Leadership Pittsburgh, which we have two invoices at $6,600, and that's for, I believe, um, Director mm -hmm. Schmidt as well as Chief Raglan. Oh, that's great. To go through Leadership Pittsburgh. Good. And we need to waive the rules for Pro Knitwear, um, which is, has a total of $6,625, yeah. um, which our Parks Department uses for T-shirts when they have races and events of the like. Okay, motion to waive the rules. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The rules have been waived. Any further discussion on invoices? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Invoices aye. have been approved. Mr. Slister. Now that takes us to interdepartmental transfers. Need a motion to approve the transfers? Uh, so moved. Second. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Those are all okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Transfers are approved. That takes us to P cards. Need a motion to approve the P cards. So moved. Brief discussion, please. Second. Discussion? Comes yeah, same, same thing, Mr. Chair, being that we've had such a, an unusual amount. Um, I've, had a, a, I've had an opportunity to pass through them, but just solicitor, you, you generally review these just for I identification. Haven't, I haven't reviewed the P card. That's stuff. okay then. Um, you have those? Yes. Yeah. There are seven items that need to be, to, to be waived so, to approve. One is for Twillow. Which is supports 311. Okay. And that total is $7,995. Still City Media, which is uh, purchases for human relation resources, as 7000 Online Ship Supplies, which is a total of 6354 which supports fire, EMS, and public safety. Pittsburgh Tire Surface, uh, three purchases of $6,200. Um, And then, oh, Zero Fossil Inc., which was two purchases for two separate events in two separate departments, totaling $6,000. Valley Tire Bell Vernon, which is three purchases made on different dates of $5,800 for DPW. And then PayPal. And that will support uh, puppet shows for uh, Department of Parks and Rec. Perfect. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Appreciate your diligence. Uh, motion to waive the rules on uh, uh, P cards. Second. <coughs> all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yep. Now, all those in favor of P approving the P card say aye. Aye. Any opposed? P cards have been approved. Now that takes us to Public Safety and Wellness Committee, which is chaired by Councilman Coghill. Um, we have two supplemental papers. I'm assuming you want these both read together. Uh, sure. And then I have yeah. yep. Okay. So, Madam Clerk, can we please rebuild? 1845 and 1846. Bill 1845, ordinance amending the Pittsburgh Code of Ordinances, Title mm. IV, Public Places and Property. Article 11, Parks and Playgrounds, Chapter 473, Use Regulations, Section 473.01, Park Property. And Title VI, Conduct, Article 11, Weapons, Chapter 6. 95 general weapons provisions section 695.04 use of weapons by discharge by adding exceptions to allow for the implementation of a deer management program and bill 1846 resolution authorizing the mayor and the director of the department of public safety to enter into an agreement or agreements with the united states department of agriculture for services relating to a cooperative wildlife damage management program for white-tailed deer for a sum not to exceed $10,251.07. Motion to approve a uh, long discussion, probably. Second with discussion. <laughs> Second with discussion. <laughs> Second with discussion, please. I'd also like to make a motion to amend. Second. You're amending Bill 1845? 1845, yeah, excuse okay. me, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any discussion on the amendment? Discussion on the amendment. Discussion. Want to walk us through it? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the amendment specifically it's just uh, some slight changes to the language but yeah yeah yeah, went, yeah. is there someone who can walk us the through the changes the solicitors here maybe we so can we have a copy of the are. table yeah. 
Are you calling the solicitor? Director, would you like to just walk us through the changes on the amendment? Mm -hmm. yeah. Morning, Director. Morning, everyone. Uh, apologies. The, uh, the changes in the amendment that you have in front of you are technical in nature regarding the contractual relationship between the city of Pittsburgh and the United States Department of Agriculture, um, which is one of the two authorizations where, that is being sought today. These were worked out between USDA's legal counsel and the city law department over the weekend, which is the reason for the, the late uh, introduction. So they don't have a substantive effect on the outcome of the legislation that members of the public will see or that our um, uh, our program will entail. They're simply meant to further clarify and document in agreement between the legal counsel of both parties what the uh, program will entail and how that agreement will be structured. Over anything? So, mm -hmm. okay. Councilman Cross? Yeah, maybe we have the solicitor. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Come down here so I can see you. Would you? Thank you. It's, it is nice to see you. I haven't seen you in, in quite some time, so it is nice Good to, to see, see you. you. Thank you. Uh, and the reason that, that I'm asking for a solicitor to be here is I have this entitled as the law reviewed version of the, of the ordinance. So That's I'm just correct. curious as to your thoughts uh, as to uh, the technical amendments here, what they propose. It, you know, I, I don't mean you to go through it detail by detail, but to give the, the, the council an overview as to the importance of uh, how or why we changed some of the verbiage uh, in the technical uh, agreements. Sure, and to be clear, um, it was uh, a council, um, it, it wasn't me who worked on it with uh. the USDA over the weekend, but that said, um, in my review of it, we started with the USDA version, but we wanted to make sure that we've got all of the proper city um, issues involved, and also we're trying to tailor it as much as possible so that it was not um, overly exclusive. So, uh, in going back and forth, the USDA had some requests that they needed from their side. We had some requests from our side. Um, and I think we came to a, a good um, agreement. So both sides are in agreement, and I think we are in a good position to be able to move this. Um, so, so if process. you're not the person to ask this question of, please just tell me. Oh, and I'll, okay. I know. Uh, but I'm trying to understand, and maybe, Director, you can help me to understand this, uh, the, in, the involvement of the, uh, of the um, USDA and, and how and why we got to where it is that we got and the requirement to, to do this calling of the deer the way we're doing it. Because I'm not 100% sure I understand I the particulars that, of that. And I don't know, I defer to the Deputy Mayor, but Chief Frank was originally involved with the first discussions with the USDA, so she may be best up Chief Frank is here if you'd like to join us. Thank you, Chief. There, we, we, we had one person speak. Come down so I can see you. Thank you. Oh, come on. I only got a couple more months left. Um, Thank you, appreciate you being here. Um, there was one caller that, that called this morning, our first public comment, that was very concerned about the, the expedition of, of this ordinance. And, and I believe we owe it to the public to have a full understanding as to how and why this timeline is the timeline that it is. And so I'm just trying to get to that sense. So Chief Frank, if you'll introduce yourself, please. Sure, um, I'm Ms. Frank, <laughs> I'm the Chief Operating and Administrative Officer for the city. Um, sorry, there were a lot of questions in there. So uh, the, the USDA involvement, just shall I start there? Yes, please. So I think um, because this is a, a very, very new thing for the city, we wanted to have a strong partnership with an organization that has done this in lots of locations, has done it um, professionally without incident. Um, also, you know, to get um, even some just uh, uh, procedural guidance, like well, this is what the game commission is going to need. So they're just really, really experts in it, and um, will help us with 
um, everything from getting as far as we are now with the, the ordinance to actually um, the contract, I think, as you see in the scope, uh, to, to um, work with us to qualify the archers, to you know just make sure that everything is going to work, and that we're not um, uh, jumping into it, you know, sort of as newcomers and, and relative amateurs ourselves. So that's really what that partnership is. They're just very very good at this. Yeah. So so my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong, is there's there's there is a mandatory agreement that we need to engage with the USDA in some way in order to do this. And I don't know how we got there. That's what I think I'm trying to understand. That, that's your timeline question, I think. So it it, it really comes down to um, I, I think we feel some urgency to move if we're going to do this because time's not really marching on our side. What we hear from our rangers, what we hear from DPW, what we hear from the experts, I'm sure you've read the newspapers as well as I have, is that um, I've, I've seen people you know, use the phrase tipping point, that, that we're gonna get to a place where we're not gonna be able to recover our deer do not have any natural predators anymore, you know, so, um, so we, uh, but you can only, you know, do deer management in season. And so if we do the pilot now, then we can review it, we can evaluate, and we would be in a position to start with a, a more citywide deer management program in 2024. If we don't do it, now um, in the kind of pre deer hunting season, then we're gonna have to kick that all for another year. And so for the USDA to have enough time to properly qualify people to get everything kind of uh, in place in time to do that um, uh, uh, controlled archery, we have to, we just have to get the things together. So their deadline was September 6th. Oh, okay. So um, I'm trying to understand maybe, I don't know if Deputy uh, Mayor Pollock can help or I don't know, Chief Frank, uh, what was historically, what was our deer management plan? Do we have a sense of what it, it, it was? I, I apologize, I, I wasn't paying attention. We haven't had one for a very, for I think as far back as, as anyone working here presently can remember, frankly. Um, well, I should say we have engaged in efforts um, in fencing off portions of parks that have been significantly negatively impacted ecologically by, by deer overpopulation to attempt to prevent them from accessing those portions of parks and allow understory growth to resume. Um, typically that's occurred in conjunction with uh, stormwater management projects and has largely been led by PWSA. But we've found those efforts to be largely unsuccessful. It's, it's not especially easy to keep a deer getting out of a place they want to go, even with fencing and things of that nature. And, and, in, and in, you know, <clears throat> wild places, you know, um, plastic fencing, they, they can find a way around it. So mm -hmm. the city's not had um, a, a, a meaningful deer management policy for a long time. I think for many years, um, as the population has grown for a long time, that population was mainly growing in suburban and outer ring communities and hadn't been venturing mm -hmm. as deeply into the city as it is now. But as the, the uh, issue has gone unmanaged in other places as well, um, the population here has grown and the, the lack of natural predators in, uh, in, in developed areas has become a, a, again, Chief Frank used the term tipping point. We're, we're approaching that where both as it relates to the impact on public lands and, and private lands, as well as the safety impacts um, uh, caused by primarily collisions with vehicles um, is, is, is unsafe, in, in our opinion, inhumane for both the deer and a risk to the public safety. <coughs> Excuse me. So you and I had an opportunity to speak last night, and I appreciate mm -hmm. you taking the time to call. <clears throat> and one of the things that I expressed uh, to you is, is is sort of an ongoing frustration that I have not aimed at any one of you but at government in general how we tend to be reactive in nature and and not do our best always to be effective planners and managers and strategists to make certain that we don't find ourselves in a place where we have to then take reactive measures as opposed to proactive and thoughtfully planned measures and so some of the resistance that I'm meeting that I shared with you is the um, uh, 
the uh, introduction of the, a conversation of where can we go from here? We are, I know where we are right at this point in time, and, and I shared with you that I wasn't gonna vote for this. I may be the only one, but I, and I told you why. Uh, and that's not to be disruptive in any way. It is to, to, to get us on the record uh, from this day forward that we won't find ourselves in this situation again, that we will have a better um, uh, strategy. You inherit a lot of this. I understand. Trust me, this is this is not about um, about blame. It is about um, opening opportunity for us to do it better next time. I think I think to that end, if I could just quickly, and then yeah. no, my colleagues might also want to re react to this. So, one of the challenges we confronted is is we essentially learned the timing was unfortunate. We learned during the council recess. Um, that what the timeline in order to get an agreement with the USDA was at a time when we weren't able to bring this legislation any sooner than yesterday because of the timing of the recess. Had we known that earlier or had, um, you know, it, had we had that occurred at a time when council was in session, we, we would not have requested the waiver of rule eight and there would have been an opportunity for the traditional dialogue. Um, <coughs> Um, however, it was. It is true that we learned of USDA's very particular timeline at a point in which we had to ask for this expedited review. Um, to your point about proactivity versus reactivity, having learned that, um, we had essentially two options. One was to pursue somewhat expedited review now and engage in an initial pilot management program this year before the uh, conditions both among the population and within the ecosystem become worse, or to say that um, we can't pursue it that quickly and thus we have to wait an entire year uh, to engage in a management program and, and to allow the population to continue to grow and the ecological impacts to continue to compound over that time. So what we're advancing, what we're intending to advance here is as proactive a step as we can take with the information available and the consequence of not moving now is to delay a response for a, a full year, um, which is why we felt justified in requesting a waiver. But. Please. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say, and I, and I think this is a good thing that all of the kind of regulatory agencies and, and ourselves, and I'm going to guess y you all, you know, pref require the baby step first. And, and that's probably a good thing. It makes us look more <laughs> prepared and professional and, you and know, the and proactive. The Game Commission and wants the baby step and so on. So, so if we, uh, to, to um, uh, the Deputy Mayor's point, if we do that this year, I think that sets us up to engage <clears throat> over the course of the coming year in, um, uh, I think, the, the strategic questions that you want to answer. I've heard, for instance, that what I understand about the basic idea of deer population management is that you want to get yourself to a place where the population is kind of stable, and that may provide you with an opportunity to move from culling strategies to more like uh, birth control strategies. Mm -hmm. But you, you, know, you can't use birth control strategy to reduce the population, but if you get where you want to be, you can go there. To do that, we have to understand, you know, what is exactly the target pop, you know, number that we're looking for. I've heard that you want to have seven deer an acre, and we've got about 40. You know, it'll give us some time to think about what the whole picture would look like, but there is no getting to the whole picture without taking the baby step, and you have to do that in any situation. So can we I, stay I, there for just one yeah, second? Sorry. I think this amendment says it's recommended at 20... Where, where did I read this? Where as statements? It, 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 it talks about um, a full saw timber stand of a forest, which is, uh, yeah. that. I mean, that's just kind of a number that they've got um, that is a standard. But um, from all of our testimony, we believe we have way more than that. So I, I will say that I think this is the initial stuff, and we're hoping to learn from the pilot program so that in the future we'll have a better sense of what is an appropriate number? So did we learn of the pilot program through conversations with USDA? Is that, did they reach out to us because they knew we were doing this or there was an obligation of us to contact them? I'm kind of confused. I, 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 think, I think it's 
started with our, um, our rangers and our DPW folks who have just been increasingly concerned and they began to explore a number of avenues and began to understand what the game commission required and began to understand all of those things. So we kind of worked our way to that um, solution for the pilot through, you know, just figuring it out and talking to people and talking to people who had already done it, talked to Mount Lebanon, talked to the county, talked to, you know, a, a bunch of folks and really felt that this was the best way forward for a, for a city that's just really mm -hmm. beginning, um, uh, you know, deer management. So, um, I, Mr. Chair, I don't know if this is the right time to do this or not. I did ask Humane uh, Action to come in and offer some strategies, ideas for future management. I don't know that this is the appropriate time for that. I can why don't, do that. Why don't we, once we get yeah. through the actual amendment and we're discussing the bill in its totality, why don't I, do yeah, that. that would be fine. I'd be happy to do it that way. I don't want to monopolize the conversation because I know a lot of uh, a lot of members wish to uh, to engage. I um, I will. I'll end my uh, I'll end my well. Just let me ask one more question, so I have a clear understanding. The, the it is it is the USDA that is requiring that we assemble this group of volunteers to train to go out to do this, or is this is something that we're taking on? I'm, I'm just sort of a little confused about how, who is going to do it, how they're trained, and what their qualifications are. Lisa should really speak to this. The, the USDA's role is in qualifying the archers. So our agreement with them would ensure that the folks we issue permission to participate um, are adequately qualified and have agreed to um, particular terms of their ability to utilize city land in this way. So we, we, we essentially agree that we need, as a preliminary step, to assess the effectiveness of a, man, a population management strategy, that we need to uh, solicit volunteers to participate. And um, the USDA agrees to assess the qualifications and provide stipulations to those individuals that um, they, they essentially Agree to regulate the activity and, re and relationship of those uh, volunteers to our program. And just speak very briefly to one point that was raised in, in public comment earlier. Among those stipulations are that the first uh, 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 deer harvested be antlerless, which is a term of art that essentially means a doe or an immature buck, which I think speaks to a point that was, was raised earlier around focusing on those members of the population that are not in reproductive, e either are, um, if male, not in reproductive uh, yeah. phase and of the their life. And the to be or, donated. The, the first is required to be donated, and, and subsequent may be donated or, or, or not. Will, will the qualifications be shared with council to, for council to have an understanding of what we are asking of our volunteers to undertake this? I, I do have reservations about that. I just wonder if and anybody, do they need to be a city resident? Do they not? Can they be, you know, county yeah, if wide? I could just clarify, because we're not going to be training them. Our expectation is that people who have um, bow hunted, you know, for years, and, and we have a very robust bow hunting program. There's lots of people both in the county and in Western Pennsylvania who have bow hunted for years and who are really experts at that. And that's really what we're hoping for, right? We're hoping for people who have a long history of bow hunting. They'll come for the qualification to be able to establish it. And then the city will be able to choose hopefully the, you know, the people who will therefore both prioritize the safety of the situation, but also be able to prioritize um, the uh, you know, very good bow hunters make sure that the kill is as painless as possible for the deer. And that's really one of our goals as well. So is there like a professional standard set somewhere by which they'll be measured against or it's going to be their word? I don't... Um, uh, the... the uh... Just to go back to your question, it's the Game Commission. You know, the Game Commission sort of exists to protect the rights of our hunters and give them an opportunity to be hunters and so on. And so as part of establishing a professional management program, you have to open the door for a minute to folks who are just 
kind of hunters. Um, and so that's why we've got two steps in this, because um, we can't, and, and why indeed we have to pilot it. So, um, but uh, to your point, the qualifications are, um, uh, they do background checks on them, and then they actually, you know, watch them do it. They take them out to the range and they, and they test them. And uh, I believe that they are willing to test, um, oh, the numbers are gonna go out of my head, um, some number of people, and then uh, they wanna take, a, they will not, um, uh, they can only have 30 participants, and if we need to, we can sort of draw out of a hat. Now, whether or not we want our residents to have first, um, opportunity to do that is, is really up to us. I think at the moment we were thinking that yes, we should give our residents who are you know, qualified and skilled hunters first opportunity to sign up. And um, there's, you know, there's, uh, I'm trying to think what else was in the rules. It, it establishes if you're gonna participate in this, you, know, you, get, you have to be qualified, you have to pass the background check. Um, if anybody does anything that the Director of Public Safety or the USDA has told them not to do, you're out. You know, they, they, I think they're very, very serious about it. And again, they've done it in many, many places. In, in essence, sorry, in, in essence, you need to have a, a, li a bow hunting license in good standing. I see. And, Thank you. Uh, and pass a background check that determines you've not had a wildlife related criminal violation on your record within a certain period. Um, so, so you you are um, a qualified under the laws of Pennsylvania. You are a qualified bow hunter in good standing with access to um, deer tags, is what they call it, a license to take uh, to, to to harvest deer, and then that's what gets you in the door, right? And then and then of those folks, they observe your practices as a, a bow hunter. They identify from among a volunteer population the folks who are, are best qualified they provide that list to us and then we can um, select or prefer if we'd like city if, around, around city residents um, those individuals who are ultimately granted permission do we director do we have a timeline by which this is going to happen i mean a length of time i know we have to do it within deer hunting season quote unquote is there is there a number that you're looking to call uh is there a time this is going to happen one day two day four days seven days and is there a risk that we don't have enough qualified licensed bow hunters that will come in you're looking at me like that's not going to be a problem I don't, I, well I, I i certainly don't think that enough people who meet the minimum criteria for qualification is going to be any challenge even entirely among city residents frankly and and i should note here the we don't condone it and in fact take enforcement acts, acts against it. There are sometimes folks who uh, operate outside the law within our parks. Now, if, if they've been caught doing that, they would be disqualified by that, by that violation point. But there, there are any number of um, responsible sportsmen, sports people, sports women in, in, within the city you know, who participate annually in deer hunting and who are otherwise qualified to have tags and who would enter that process. Um, and then in addition to them, if we think about individuals who might live outside the city who have similar qualifications in, in the off chance, and I, I don't presume there's been the off chance that not enough city residents either apply or qualify, we can certainly meet the criteria with folks from this region. I, I don't think that's a particular concern. Um, the purpose of the pilot effort is to begin developing baseline data, right? So I, we're not going to achieve population management with the pilot. We're going to take the initial steps necessary to collect data and um, anecdotal information necessary to design an effective strategy from there. So we, we can only make it to that step if we start small with a limited number of, of available places and an opportunity for volunteers to participate to build a, a clear case that a management strategy is warranted. So, so no one should be of the impression that we will contain the potentially, the, I think, demonstrably damaging impact of overpopulation with this pilot program in this hunting season. But if we don't start now, we're only kicking the can further down the road. 
So to go back to the question of the length, one day, two day, three day, is that determined in some way? A number we're gonna know definitively that we've accomplished this one piece that we wish to accomplish? We, we will absolutely know. Yeah. I'm not sure we've chosen it yet. Yeah. Again, I'm dominating the conversation. I don't wish to because I know everybody wants to, 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 to um, participate. Uh, I, just, I just want to conclude my remarks by expressing my universal frustration. It, this is not aimed at anyone in particular in that we've gotten to this point to where we, um, where we have to approach the deer management in this what I'm going to call violent way. And it's just, it does, you know, I told you last night this, I just, I can't do this. I just, you know, yeah. and that's just me. That's, you know, that's just my constitution and my makeup. I am not able to do this, but um, I will take opportunity when the time comes to bring humane um, action to the, see, I'm getting emotional, uh, bring humane action to the table to talk about other ways that we can be more effective in the, uh, in the future. Councilman, we appreciate your questions because I do think, um, you know, this is a big important issue for a lot of people. So it still is something we should be discussing and bringing out all of these issues. So yeah, and that, appreciate that, that. Thank you very much, Lister, for saying that. And that furthers my concern as to the, the timeline in which we put this on and how we fast tracked it and, and ultimately what that then says to constituency. Yeah, no good yeah, the, the, the only thing I might add there, if you'll permit me, is that um, allowing a, a population to exceed sort of the natural limits of growth due to you know, the unique impacts of urban development, where they're you know they proliferate to a point that they're exceedingly likely to become ill, uh, to um, be killed in a car accident in a, a you know, potentially more violent and less humane way um, because of the d disequilibrium sort of between what would be a natural ecosystem where predators existed to, to maintain a, a stable population versus uh, a situation that doesn't occur and the predator essentially becomes uh, motor vehicles, right? Um, and and that, that has real impacts on Every, you know, every living entity involved is also our concern. There's not a moment in my life I've not had an animal in my life. And mm -hmm. so I've done my share of putting animals down. Mm -hmm. um, and it is always, always the goal is to do it as humanely as possible. It's, you know, it's inevitable. It's going to happen at some point in time. You have to do it. But we do it as kind and gentle and humane as we possibly can. And this just seems like such a violent way to do it. And that's really where my... My reservations come from, but thank you. I'm again. I'm dominating the conversation. I'm going to conclude my comments. Let members speak, and then, Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge, we'll bring them up later. Yep. Thank you. Still on the amendment, Councilman Gross. Thank you. I appreciate it. I I don't know if I should be constraining my comments to the amendment or to the bill in full at this point, since we've kind of opened it up to everything. But <laughs> I have had a chance to review the amendment that we just had in front of us, and it does seem um, to go to the beginning of Councilman Krause's questions that there is some change to the recitations, the whereas clauses, that um, says that there's um, forest can support up to 20 deer per square mile. It strikes the claims from USDA that our parks are at 51 deer per square mile, and I'm curious about why. Is there was there a study and then it's been questioned or so yeah. what is what is the reason for that I, I apologize councilwoman gross i'm not aware i think that was a request by the usda so i don't know if they didn't want to assert that but that's i need to find that out so let me get back to you on that okay so there was maybe some claim about what our density of deer are but we're not willing to kind of that would be my guess, is yeah. that the USDA's attorneys are like, we're not going to promise exactly how many there are because we didn't do a study on, you know, we didn't do a study. I have heard that number quite um, 
often, um, and and I certainly know that we are vastly beyond the sta- the minimum standards or you know the healthy standard, but um, I'm not aware. I also notice in the second section that it's talks of the amendment is to you know there's no hunting, but there's a, an exception that's added just for everyone's um, awareness that persons may take sex actions that are prohibited in this section with respect only to snakes known to be poisonous. So that's a new thing that wasn't in the first draft. Um, and that the, there's the section of that there's authorized, except authorized participants in this official city deer management program. Um, and then um, there's permissions added to discharge bow and arrow under that. And um, that they are only applicable to the strictures of the Game Commission and the USDA program. And then I noticed just a few other technical things like changing the part that says, you know, in partnership with USDA under a contract from one section to another. So it's really not a substantive change. Um, So those are the only things that jump out to me. I do have, with the help of my staff, a lengthy set of questions because I feel like you know, the only thing I know about this is the WESA article, but I've just heard at the table that some of that was not accurate. Um, and so with this expedited um, discussion, I feel like I've like missed a briefing because we didn't have a briefing, right? And so there's just a lot of kind of basic questions that I, if, I'll take a little bit of time, Mr. Chair, and, but if I go on for too long, then I'll, I'll you know, let other members have a chance. So can we just kind of revisit from the top? I think Councilman Krauss touched on this too. The WESA article mentioned that it was bow hunting that you will be permitting in partnership with USDA. But there are bows and then there are bows, right? There are like big mechanical things that are practically like, you know, a handgun or something. And then there are little like big long Robin Hood things with an actual string. So what are you going to be using? I've got in front of me notes like crossbows, um, compound bows, you know, long okay. bows. What, what, what are we going to be using? Not that I'm an expert in these things, but. Um, uh, comp, uh, uh, a, uh, a bow, I believe, I, 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 I might be um, summarizing here, but a bow in Pennsylvania is a, a, a device that delivers a projectile via like um, kinetic rather than combustion force, right? right? So, so a right, right. A, Councilman uh, Warwick's Councilman Warwick's just advised me that we can revisit this later because there actually are some experts in the room. So I won't put you on the spot sure. for that one. Just, just, well, long, <laughs> just long and short is is that um, you know basically if you think about a gun, it, it contains a uh, confined explosion to propel a projectile. A bow, whether a long bow. Uh, crossbow or a compound bow it, the sort of like the energy comes from the effort of the person drawing yeah but some of those bows are very very mechanized and go very very shoot and arrow very very far so we'll let the expert talk to that in a minute sure um so um i the wsa article said it was a one day call and then i saw some shaking heads so did we answer that question we can, should we wait maybe for that one too? We'll revisit, we'll revisit that one in a minute. Um, uh, we talked about the bucks. We talked about, I think that the, the hunters do have to have oh, game commission issued tags. Um, and I just want to comment for a minute. I think we'll probably get back to this too, that the damage to the parks, I mean, I've seen pictures, I think especially it was Riverview Park. It was maybe, I'm not even sure, it might've been before Councilman Wilson was elected. I went to a conference on urban soils because having served for six years at PwSA and li- paying attention to stormwater issues, uh, landslides, which I have very damaging landslides in my district, um, I wanted to know more. And there's a, it's a fairly large local conference of experts on soil. And so, um, you know, one of your pilot sites was one of the parts that I was look, you know, watching an entire half hour slideshow about between the jumping worms that are invasive that have like eaten everything that would normally be protecting the soil through the leaf layers and all that kind of stuff. And then the deer 
which I've learned the technical term, just like goats, are browsers, not grazers. So like sheep eat grass, but deer eat brush, and so they're browsers. And so they've cleared out all of the shrubs and small trees, and so they just devour everything. And so you end up with just bare dirt, you know, at the top of a hill, and you get landslides. Um, and so there's nothing retaining the water. We know that that protective forest floor and the native shrubs and trees are the best things for retaining our stormwater. Um, and so it isn't just a little damage. It isn't just a constrained small amount of damage. Um, I heard someone liken them to trails. Um, and for the kind of long-term health of the park forest and of the stability of the actual hillsides, um, we do need to be concerned about restoring um, the native plants and forest floor layer. So that, that is an issue. I, I, I would like to understand more of, um, about the pilot sites that are chosen as well. Um, and then, I'll, I'll, again, I'll revisit this when we have more experts at the table, but kind of how we are protecting the public how is the area going to be cordoned off? How is there going to be kind of signage? If, you know, I have no idea what you're going to do. How are we going to let people know what you're going to do? Um, and so that everybody can stay safe um, if we do it. So I do you have, have an any answer. of those answers? Yes. I, I, well, I do have an answer on the question about timing. Thank you. Just to clarify that one. So um, the, the uh, broader rules governing a pilot of this type require that the... Um, Period, the the, the um, management period be contained to within normal deer hunting season, which is, of course, not one day. It begins as early as September 18th. We're not looking to target anything that soon. But, um, but we have the ability to establish a time frame within the normal deer hunting season um, during which these activities can be conducted. And that's not a determination that's been made yet. So... so while it is true um, as a matter of form that it could be as little as one day, we would anticipate a multi-day program. Um, exactly which and how many days are, are uh, things that we look to determine in conjunction with some of the other questions you've raised around um, appropriate pr protocol uh, to, to, to effectively manage the areas in which this could occur. But, but uh, one day is, is not, I think, our intention, um, even if it is technically possible. And that might be the cause of the confusion uh, cited in that report. Right. So, again, it, then we, I think Katzman cross touched on this, too. Then we need, I think we need, and the public needs to understand, kind of like, well, then what is the goal? Like, when is enough enough? How do you know whether you're going to do it for 30 days or two days? Or it's, I'm really confused. I didn't know how to ask I feel like question. somebody should know that. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the expert here. Yeah. I didn't know how to ask that question. But that's yeah. the question. When is, when is I, right, right. I think, I think we, I could tell you how and we would you, arrive at that answer. If you don't know at this answer. instant, like when will you know it? Like how, how is that arrived at? And, and who arrives at it? And what are, what are their right. things? So, so maybe, I feel like if you've got an answer, that's great. But also it seems like Councilman Wilson wants to touch up on this line of question. how we would arrive at the answer. And I think that's in the, in the scope that you're seeing. So I think the uh, critical parties in that conversation would be the USDA, our rangers, and our public safety department to arrive at enough of a pilot, but no more than enough of a pilot so that we can do the kinds of assessments that we need to do to get the experience under our belt, to be able to do the kind of post pilot um, debrief without con inconveniencing the public any more than we need to do. So I think our general direction is to go light here. As, as, as the deputy mayor has said, we can't achieve um, population stability with this pilot. What we need to achieve is self-understanding and, and whatnot. So the conversation, I think, around that would be worked out with those parties and understanding what those goals are. And I, don't, I think people already know enough to know that you probably can't get that done in one day, but I don't think we're talking about 30 days, certainly not 30 days. I'll, I'll stop there, but these are, these are, I feel like there's a couple of 
unanswered questions, but I'll, I'll let the conversation continue. Thank you. Councilman Cockhill. Thank you. Um, this is relevant to this conversation. I wanted to let you know I was an avid hunter from the time I was 12 to about 18 years old. You know, lost interest it, in it over a period of time. But my brothers and I, being both avid hunters, we knew if there was a deer in and around our house in Pittsburgh, okay? There were none. In the late 70s, you could not find a deer. There were no deer living inside a stray or two maybe, but there was not herds and the, the, the population was nothing to be concerned about back then. And I live on a big greenway and we had the biggest area of woods in the city of Pittsburgh. We used to go down there, we used to look for tracks, we used to think, why aren't there any deer in here? But, but there weren't. So, so, and that's relevant uh, for a couple reasons because whether it's development up in Cranberry and all the surrounding suburbs, why that population came you know, south into Pittsburgh or north, um, I'm not quite sure of that, but I will tell you, you know, 35 years ago, there was, you couldn't, you couldn't find a deer. I live on one of the busiest streets in the city of Pittsburgh right now. I have a herd of five or six deer living in my backyard. I feed them crackers out of my hand. I mean, they're just everywhere, right? I see them walking up West Liberty Avenue. Um, it's, it's amazing. I just can't believe that with the population of the deer, how it's increased. I don't know how, I don't know why that, that is, but. I will tell you it's a stark difference from when, when, when I was a younger man, you know. So, uh, so in this call, we have it worked out where the hunter or hunters, when they, you know, um, bag their first doe, they have to give that meat to us for food banks things of that nature, wherever we decide to distribute to. And, to, and that's to what a food doing. bank. They don't give it to us. To, they a, to a food bank, bank. They, okay. they're required to give it yeah, to Yeah, we don't want it. Yeah, we right. give it to a food bank. They have it processed. The food bank pays for processing it, I guess. I'm not sure. Depends on who they donate it to. Yeah. Um, there, for example, there's an organization called Hunters Sharing the Harvest um, who do handle that processing. Um, if they, if they were to choose to give it to a different food bank, they may or may not, depending on what they choose to give it okay. to, pay, it cover the cost of, and the, the you know experience of processing it themselves, but they are required to contribute their first harvest to a food bank. And um, you know those hunters who harvest at least two deer are prior, would be prioritized in future rounds, but which I mean, we're not necessarily sure that at this pilot stage, anyone's going to get more than one or two, um, broadly speaking. Again, that depends on how many people sign up. Okay, well, I think that's important because, you know, as we know through COVID and everything, that, you know, sup the food supply and the people, you know, um, you know, just the cost of buying meat uh, is, is uh, you know, so, so if we can feed people with this, that's, that's an advantage. That's a bonus for me. Um, but you're saying... If you have mult, if you have a multiple tag, you can bag two of them. You can, you, but the first one goes to a food bank. In order to participate in our program, the first antlerless you are required to take an antlerless deer deer first, which would mean either a female or an immature male, and you are required to uh, donate the proceeds of that to a food bank, which may or may not include. The, one, the designated one that we know handles some of that processing. Got it. Um, you're able to take only what you have appropriate tags for. Of course, yeah. right, right. Um, so I do a lot of work in Mount Lebanon. I know Mount Lebanon, I know a lot of people live there. I just, a lot of, I fre frequent the place often. They went through this a couple of years back, okay. Um, it wasn't because they were eating the flowers and, you know, attacking your garden. They did it mostly out of the concern of safety, public safety. Um, Route 19 is a very busy corridor. They would cross there like you wouldn't believe. So it became a danger to motor vehicles. And, you know, my father was a truck driver. He'll tell you number one reason why people were killed on the highway is trying to avoid a deer. Okay, yeah. doing a sharp turn when you're going 45, 50 mile an hour. 
Um, so it became more a safety concern for the citizens, I will tell you, in Mount Lebanon, and that's why they approached that. Of course, there are other uh, you know, factors. I, I was actually there at the time. Oh, were you? Uh, uh, I, I've never lived in Mount Lebanon, um, but I, I was the chief of staff to the then state senator oh, for Mount right, Lebanon right, at right, the period right. where the, the municipality was considering that question. And um, as a result of that, participated in some of those conversations, attended some of those public meetings. I will agree with you that the primary motivation of the municipality was the sharp and concerning increase in uh, deer v motor vehicle collisions and the public safety implications of that. Um, the, the public dialogue was certainly very robust and they explored a number of different options at that time given the best information that was available at the time, but I agree that their primary driving consideration was an exponentially growing population that was creating real safety risks. And what I would say is that that very real risk has mi now migrated across the city line into um, city neighborhoods. You know, from there certainly into your district, Councilman. But but it's no less a reality um, in 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 the north side or in the east end and areas around our larger parks, where again migrating in from the outside, large populations of deer that are not managed in the ecologically uh, regular way via predators or are, are growing very rapidly and causing very real safety risks. Right. And if you'd have told me I, the day would come where I'm feeding deer in my backyard on Wenzel Avenue, mm -hmm. um, I would have said you're, you're crazy. Okay. Um, but, but that is the case today. So there's no question the population is, I don't even, I don't even want to say it fluctuates. Okay. But there's no doubt about it. We have a large population in my district, I will tell you. I'm surprised we don't see them downtown, honestly. I don't know. They're close. I know they're all over Mount Washington and everything like that. Yeah, they're working from home. <laughs> I, I, I've seen one on South 18th Street in, oh, did you? in, in yeah. the South Side Slopes, which it's is crazy. pretty deep in. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So, you know, I got some, e some emails and some texts today, um, you know, some, from some folks that want to protest this. And my, my message to them would be, you know, if you eat beef or pork, um, you know, it's the same thing. Okay, you, the animal, you kill the animal and you eat. It's been going on for thousands and forever. So there's nothing inhumane about it. I find hunters, in my, when I used to hunt, are some of the most uh, respectful, careful, uh, responsible people. Um, and nobody I know ever hunts just for the game of it. It's always about, you know, they, they love it. They make jerky and, you know, they... You know they, they eat it so so it's good it actually saves them money on their grocery bills so um, so that argument doesn't hold up for me I will tell you um, unless you're gonna protest the farmers across America and everybody else that's um, or, okay so my main concern is and somebody touched on it earlier like you know when whether it's two days three days ten days whatever it is obviously these are in places that are frequented by families kids things of that nature we're obviously going to shut that area down. Um, but I just wonder, like, what's to keep a 12-year-old kid who doesn't read up on what the city's doing and has a secret way into those woods from being in there? And are we going to have rangers kind of circumferencing the area? Or um, And I know Councilwoman Gross touched on this, and that's to me, is the most important factor of this, is that it's done safely. I believe the agencies you're working with are very reputable, very safe. I just worry about the perimeter and somebody, a couple of 12 year old kids that uh, don't keep up on what the city of Pittsburgh is doing and the calling. So I would imagine that those are in place. Do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, we, so we will be shutting it down sure. um, and, and posting probably public safety people, um, you know, using DPW uh, cross arms and, and, and the like to shut it down. We will be posting um, as well. And I will say that's going to be something that we go over with our hunters as well. Absolutely. So they are going to be very aware that this is not, you know, and as they are, as, as you talked about, Councilman, I mean, uh, this is something that hunters 
face a lot when they go out, right? They could have run into people who are just hiking on a game lands or something along those lines. And so they have to be careful. That is certainly something we will be stressing with our hunters as well, that um, they need to be on the lookout and that they need to make sure that, you know, they need to be safe. Right. They right. need to err on the side of caution and that we're um, making sure that everyone's... Mm. So, so, so the, the USDA requirements uh, establish that hunters may establish at least two tree stands for the purposes of their mm -hmm. hunt. And I, I, I bring that up because... I'm sorry, they will or won't? They will be able to establish at least uh, as, as many as two, right? So they can have one or two, no more than two. My point is we would anticipate that they will be shooting down, not laterally. Right, which, which which also is an important safety precaution in a situation like this. It, it dramatically decrease even if you miss. It dramatically decreases the um, vertical travel of a projectile. Yeah, I would say be careful with that because yes, tree stands is typically how they bow hunt. Right, and back to the um, compound bows, crossbows, and I'll wait for the experts to come up here as well. But I believe a crossbow is a trigger, and the arrow goes. Mm -hmm. um, compound bow is just a bigger bow that's easily brought back and then there's a regular bow which is you know um what they've been doing for thousands of years so um so i'd be interested in that i believe like a compound bow um that projectile will go much further and you know we can't count on them being up on the tree and shooting down if some doe walks out in front of them and they're at the bottom of the hill and the doe's at the top you know it's going to go up so they don't they're not restricted to I don't want to say fire, uh, I don't know what the term is for, for bows, but they're not restricted to be in a tree stand is what I'm saying, so. Oh. I'll also just state that is part of the reason we entered into the contract with the USDA is because they have had such a long experience with this with no negative consequences. So it, we really wanted to, this isn't the kind of thing that we just, you know wanted to do it on our own and sure. start it fresh we wanted to be able to use a program that has been successful and safe in right, the past. Right. and i would say finally you know um nobody i i quit hunting because i, I killed a couple deer and I, it wasn't for me okay so and i don't eat i don't eat the the meat so to the, for those two reasons i i've never picked up a hunting rifle since i was the time of 18 years old but the whether it's, and I'm not quite clear as to, you know, if you have a tag for two dough, you have to give the first one to a food bank, or what if you have a tag just for one dough? I, I, I'm, what I'm, what I, I guess what I'm getting to is, if there's the need, which I believe there is, to feed people, uh, you know, I think we should get the maximum effort out of this call in distribution of the venison to whoever is going to eat it and wherever it's needed um so i'm not first harvested first harvested is an explicit requirement so if you have one doe tag and you participate oh okay right right and you participate then right. by definition right. that would require right. to be donated and i will tell you knowing the hunting community if they knew it was going to food pantries to feed people um they would gladly come in there just for that reason no, yeah, I also not only for their own sake. I want to let people know, too, there is also a program that the Game Commission does where you can sign up if you, because some people have um, uh, medical reasons that mean they can't eat commercialized meat. And so um, the Game Commission is also, there's, there's a list of people who need to eat venison in order to be able to eat meat. And um, they also have a great program that way. So, right. so I would just like to get the maximum if it's, if it's everyone. So I, I imagine it's going to be, uh, and that would be city food pantries. It, 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 so hunter sharing the harvest, for example, is a, a statewide um, initiative uh, that is specifically designed for the processing uh, and donation of um wild caught rather than commercially raised uh, uh meat products i don't i don't believe that it's localized in that way right okay well that's an option certainly yeah. but we'll look into that sure council. sure uh you know it's not something i really wanted to see either i'm with the councilman here but uh, i feel it's necessary at this point and i do feel that um you know there's a danger in overpopulation of deer jumping out on our highways and people wrecking and dying so if you're comparing the life of a human being to a deer, 
I'm going to sigh on a human being every time. So I, I will be supporting it. Or, you. or even a deer dying slowly and painfully due, a, due to a vehicle accident. All you rather have to do than is look on the side of the road, right? Yep. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Wilson. Yeah, I'm thinking I might reserve questions until I guess there's other. I don't know what the plan is. So well, we're someone, still on the amendment. Almost a guy, so, like who's coming up. And I, I think it would be helpful if we reserve comment until we amend the bill. Any further comment on the amendment? Second round, Councilwoman uh, Warwick. Um, so, yeah, I just. say is um, as far as this sort of being sudden I do want to clarify that you know since I got here in December this is the one of the very first things that was on my desk from my constituents and um, I know that um, Chief Frank and uh, lots of other folks have been working very very hard for many many months on this so I don't I, I do want to sort of I, I understand that for the public this is the, and there have been a few articles, oh, sorry, sorry. And there have been a few articles uh, here and there over the course of the months, but nothing like now, right? Obviously with the introduction of this bill. Um, as far as the, um, you know, why we needed to waive rule eight and expedite. Now, I, I can't speak to why it has taken so long to kind of get all the ducks in a row. Um, I do understand the, the deadline given by the USDA. Um, and again, you all can speak to that when, when, when we get to it. But um, uh, I do want to say that I think here now there are a lot, because of this suddenness, there are lots of questions, right, about why do we need to do this? How are we going to do this? And so because, there, because we are under the gun at this time, and we do have this short time frame, in lieu of uh, a, a post agenda or something, or, or a briefing or something like that, we have here a number of folks. So um, we have the, is it the Humane Society? Humane Action. Humane Action, okay, so Humane Action. We have um, the Citywide Deer Management Task Force, we have our park rangers, and we have public safety. So again, this is my recommendation, it's at the, uh, you know, the chair, uh, up to the chair, of course, but. I, I don't know how this will work with so many people to come talk at the table. I've Thank never experienced this before. Yeah, yeah, but I do just want to say that once we do begin discussion on the amendment, m my recommendation would be to begin with the concerns, which would, I would say humane action would be the representative of sort of the concerns of, that so many people do have about this program um, and the hopes for the future. Then the, um, then the why, and for that I would say that the folks who are here from the Citywide Deer Management Task Force and also, um, I believe, Erica Hyde from the Park Rangers, um, and then after that I would start to focus on the how, and that would be, again, with public safety, and I believe John Furman is here, you know, so, so, and that would be the how. And so I think that might help organize the conversation a little bit so that we can kind of go through methodically and, and make sure that everybody's questions are addressed because these are all important questions, but it's kind of hard, you know, I, I don't want to ask all the questions to the, to, you know, to this, and we only have so many chairs, so at the table. <laughs> so uh, at any rate, with that all said, um, motion to amend. Second. We, we, we did motion. Yeah, we made the oh, motion. Sorry, motion to, oh, okay, sorry, okay. So seeing no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The bill has been amended. Discussion on the bill as amended. Councilman Krause? I believe they're excused for the moment. Is that correct? Yes. Correct? Thank you. But don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> I think we might. And then, yeah. may I? Would it be, may I call Humane Action then? Is that, is that okay yeah, to do absolutely. that at this? So may we have representatives from Humane Action come up, please? Good morning, Natalie. Come on up. He's going to go back to my office and get some lunch for everybody watching. Okay. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Director. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, 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 you're, you're coming to the table for the first time, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So come on up. It's like Thanksgiving. You got the big, the big table. We'll sit here so we can be. Thank you. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Good morning. 
Good morning. So um, is this your first time at the table? Yeah, I've right. always had yeah. to be back at that little stand. Yeah. So I remember Moving my up. first time at the table. Uh, it was terrifying. <laughs> so please don't be afraid. You're amongst friends. But we do need you to introduce yourself, uh, uh, first, last name, and, and organization you represent, please. Sure. Um, I'm Natalie Alwish, the Executive Director of Humane Action Pittsburgh. I live in the South Side Slopes in Councilman Krause's district. I don't think you asked for that. but It's okay. And please. <laughs> I'm Shannon Dickerson. Um, I'm also with Humane Action Pittsburgh, their director of operations. Great. So w we had an opportunity uh, uh, to, to speak last Friday at a breakfast uh, about the bills potentially coming to, to council. And, and, and you and I had exchanged some thoughts about how we got here and how we might be able to do things Councilman better. Krause, I'm sorry. What am I? We have Madam President on the line. Sure. I'm just ask her to register her I vote because she needs to. Sure. Madam President. Madam President. Yes, I'd like to register an I vote. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank you. President. Thank you, Councilman. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and so and so I, I thought our uh, I thought your responses to the conversation were very enlightened. I, th I found them to be uh, very spot on. We understand the reality of the situation that we are in, uh, but there are probably some better ways we could do things. And that's really why I wanted you to, to come down and, and speak to the council and, and share your experience, which is voluminous, uh, uh, with the council as to how we may not find ourselves in this situation again and, and do things a little differently. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let Shannon do most of the talking because she really is the expert on our team on this yeah. issue. but. I do want to say, you know, as an organization, we are an animal welfare organization, as I think you all know, we've worked with you before. We acknowledge that deer are overpopulated in our community, so we're not, we're not disputing that. Um, we have been researching this issue for well over a year. We reached out to Mayor Ganey's administration last year to discuss non-lethal options. So just to be clear, and so we're all on the same page, any management option, whether lethal or non-lethal, is going to have to be done every single year forever to be effective. So whether it's a call or whether it's birth control, it has to be done every single year. Over the long run, surgical sterilization, which is the option that we are recommending and that we brought to the mayor's office last year, is more effective in keeping the population numbers down and it's more cost effective for taxpayers. And so we really feel like, you know, this discussion has been going on for a long time behind the scenes apparently and now it's all of a sudden a huge rush with no time for public dissemination we haven't seen anything in the plan in terms of long-term management plans and so we share some of the concerns that some of you brought as well um, but I'm gonna pass it to Shannon to speak more um, on our concerns yeah I, I think that you know what we just want to address is um, I, of course, echo everything that Natalie said. I, I headed up a lot of the research that we did into, you know, what our recommendation should be and why and speaking to experts across the country and other municipalities who have done deer management programs. And so, again, I just want to emphasize, like, we, we agree that steps need to be taken. Um, we don't think that, you know, to all of your points, um, Councilman, that this is something that needs to be ignored or, you know, putting deer ahead of public safety and human lives. Uh, not at all. Um, but... We're just not getting questions answered, some of which um, you brought up this morning, uh, several of you, as far as, you know, we're, we're hearing that this pilot is required to do any kind of long-term management, but we're not seeing where that language is coming from. Who's requiring this pilot? Who's requiring the nature, uh, the specific nature of this pilot? Uh, there's a study referenced in the ordinance uh, from the USDA that we're unaware of. Um, we know that the numbers have been struck from it in the amendment now uh, mm -hmm. this morning. But, um, you know, all the experts I've spoken to, in order to do an accurate count, which to our knowledge has not been conducted by um, anyone, the city or the USDA or otherwise, it would cost around $200,000 just to get an accurate count. They're saying that this pilot with volunteer bow hunters is going to somehow help with understanding our numbers better or understanding how to control the population better. Um, but it doesn't seem like this, I mean, by the own uh, admission of our administration, and that's certainly not a criticism, but this pilot is not intended to work. It's just a requirement that we have to do. 
but we're not seeing that there's been evidence to demonstrate that point. Who's requiring the pilot? Who's requiring the nature of this pilot? Who's requiring this timeline? We don't have those answers. We, we asked, and uh, we don't know if it's federal. We don't know if it's state. We don't know if it's, you know, language from our game commission. Um, we, we just, we, there's a lot of unanswered questions, and it seems like if we know it's not going to work, and we can't demonstrate that it is required, why the rush? Why the urgency? Why can't we have these questions answered before we make such a rash decision and move forward with this? So that's really um, our position. Mm -hmm. And just to, just to cap off, we really just feel like, why is non-lethal not even being considered when we did bring that option over nine months ago to the mayor's office? Mm -hmm. It's not even up for discussion. Mm -hmm. it, well, so um, I, I, how do I want to formulate my question? The um, uh, I, some of my re reservations are based in comments that you made as to understanding the totality of the problem. How, what's the expression? When you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, that we're, we're kind of just, we're going after because we know it's a problem, but we don't quite understand fully the scope of the problem. This is to sort of kind of get started. Um, and I, I had the same question with uh, uh, the Deputy Mayor Pollock last night when we spoke about uh, the requirement and how we got to this point where we're being told that we have to do it this way in order to do any other effective uh, deer population management in the future. So I, I promise I will, we will get that clarification and, and share with you how and why we got to where, uh, how and why we got to where we, we, uh, we are at this moment in time. But if, if you were to, to be able to offer to this council um, recommendations, uh, because th this bill's gonna pass. This, uh, I know this bill's gonna pass. Um, and, and we will ultimately launch this strategy but my hope in the last four months that i have here is to make certain that we put um, preventative measures in place that we don't get here again and maybe part maybe part of the passage of this bill is a requirement that certain things take place at certain, councilwoman strasberger is really good at this kind of stuff but we put requirements in place that at certain moments in time certain strategies have to be implemented so as to prevent us from ever finding ourselves back here again and i'll be happy to work with you councilwoman warwick and um on how we can do that but would you have some suggestions possibly as to what that might look like well i think that you know there are a lot of options you heard in public comment today um some people who are against this moving forward are also against sterilization and therefore a birth control method with darting um you can't even get a panel together of experts in non-lethal management of deer populations there just aren't enough people who practice this as their you know primary profession, but we did speak to the foremost ones who have done programs in New York City. Um, they're starting a program in Cuyahoga County, and they've been doing this for over 30 years. And their recommendation is a surgical sterilization program that, in the long term, and to echo Natalie's sentiments, any management program will have to be repeated every single year, um, in the long term, will be the most cost effective. If you're doing a call and you're doing it effectively, you frankly have to kill enough deer. And obviously that's not our wish, but if you want to control the population, if that's your goal, you have to kill about 80% of your deer. Yeah. Volunteers going in with bows are not going to do that. What they're going to do is take the population down a small amount, which frees up resources, food and other resources, to make the deer that do stay healthier and this is a well-documented phenomenon. This increases twin and triplet births, and then you get a higher population than when you started. Please say that again. So if you don't kill enough deer, you only kill enough deer to provide more natural resources to the ones that remain. There's a well-documented phenomenon that this increases deer populations because you have a healthier population and a higher rate of twin and triplet births. Mm. So. If you're not doing a call effectively, you're getting volunteers, you're not having it done professionally, you don't have an accurate count to know how many you need to take it down, et cetera. 
you are going to create a much bigger problem. And so anything has to be done in a very expensive way, whether it's a call or otherwise, because you have to have professionals doing it. You can't just have volunteers coming in and haphazardly killing some deer here, some deer there, not knowing how many the goal is, the number you're starting with, and the percentage to get them down to, mm -hmm. or you're gonna be causing more problems. So Shannon, when you say surgical sterilization, are you talking much like uh, trapped uh, neuter release? Exactly. Trapped spay, in, in, spay in neuter, our, uh, forgive me. Well, yes. Either both. Tiana. And release, right? Yes. Yeah, like we do with, fe with feral cat populations. Yes, and because of the nature of deer males versus females, we have been told that the recommendation would be to do females, and it's done right out in the field. So you have veterinarians, the, someone is darting them, you know, tagging them, and a the veterinarian is literally performing the procedure out in the On field. On site. Mm -hmm. well, that's, uh, I would love, well, I mean, I'd love to holistically ex dive into that com that sort of approach. Uh, and, and then there becomes the <laughs> budgetary impacts mm -hmm. and how you <laughs> wrestle with the budgetary impacts of doing something along those lines. And, and we admit that upfront a call is less expensive. But again, in the long term, because of the effects of a call versus sterilization, the costs will average out and eventually, and I can't give you an exact number of years, it's dependent on you know, your topography, the size of the location, the deer population that starts with, so I couldn't speak to at year seven, it will even out. Unfortunately, I don't have that information, and I don't think that anyone really does since we don't even have a count at this time. But um, eventually, if you're effectively managing the deer on an annual basis, which would be required to um, do this appropriately, it would be more cost effective as well. And safer. Pay me now, pay me later. <laughs> um, uh, that's my questions for this moment in time. I don't want to dominate. I'd like to op open it up for other members who might have questions. Thank you. I've got Councilwoman Strasberger next. Thank you, and thank you for being here. Um, I did want to dig in a little bit. You don't have to get me the numbers now, but when I also approached the administration um, uh, winter of last year and you know um, at the urging of so many constituents who are extremely concerned you know some part of the district I represent is between two regional parks so the deer are constantly crossing and on our roads and in our yards um, and I, I too fear for um, those who are you know driving and get in, into a collision more so swerving to avoid a deer and striking a pedestrian that's my worst fear here actually um, so at the urging of my of the constituents I represent, um, did bring this up a, a, almost a year ago, and I'm grateful that we are at the point where we're actually considering action. Okay, so at that time, I heard that from other experiences in other municipalities, that the um, as you in, as you sort of insinuated that that maybe in the, the that in the short term, um, sterilization and birth control is both more expensive and less effective. And I understand there's the conversation about, you know, maybe over time, but how much money are we spending to be able to get to that maintenance versus something that's effective now where we can then think about maintenance down the line. I think it's a great idea to create um, a requirement that we devise a plan, develop a plan for maintenance into the future. Um, I also just wanted to state that, um, so, so I guess my question for you is, can you provide us with numbers? I know it's impossible to predict what would happen in Pittsburgh, but can you provide us with numbers that back up your claim that it is indeed less expensive and more effective? Because I, that's counter to what I've heard. So I can, I can only cite um, another uh, experience with this. Um, in uh, New York City, they actually did a non-lethal program. And that's the, honestly the only thing that I can cite because everything is specific to the region that you're in, right? Um, I don't even know what a call would cost effectively here because we don't have that information or those numbers. Um, but what I can say is, I think that it's been demonstrated today that the call plan that we have will certainly not work. We don't even have answers to the questions, the basics of what this pilot program will look like. And so I don't think that it's a question of, you know, if, if this pilot is required in order to do any kind of long-term management, we, 
we would not be objecting um, if, but we haven't been shown that that's actually the case. And then there are no long-term plans to, for us to, to see or um, kind of dissect and answer that question because we can't, I mean, we can't show you that a call would be effective either because it's the, it hasn't been a fully kind of like thought out program yet. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to um, dodge your question, I guess. It, uh, we don't even have a deer population to give those, those answers. But I can cite a specific experience in New York City where they did have success with a sterilization program and the cost was more effective in the long term. And for them, the reason I gave the example of year seven before was that was the year that they kind of hit the tipping point where it was more cost effective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. And I'll also just state, and this is gonna be my last comment for now until we have other speakers up here, um, which is that I think when we're talking about costs, it's also imperative that we bring in the externalities of the cost of less in tree, you know, diminished tree canopy and understory, the cost of landslides to our city, which have been mm -hmm. extremely damaging to our budget over year after year. Um, the cost of uh, not even doing nothing, but the cost of an ineffective program over time mm -hmm. and, and a lack of maintenance. So um, that was just the last thing I wanted to state for now and I'll reserve further comment until later. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Cockhill. Thank you. Um, hello, Natalie. Uh, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Shannon. Shannon. Okay, thank you, Shannon. So I, I've never heard about the non-lethal before, and you explained to some degree. But so I understand that would be like a dart to knock the animal out. Mm -hmm. Then they would come in and do the mm -hmm. whatever they need to do to spay mm -hmm. them. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So my first instinct is that seems awfully expensive. But, and, I, and the other point I wanted to make is what we're proposing or what the administration's proposing, it's $10,000 or so. Um, I think our expenses are probably just in the personnel that we have to secure the place and mm -hmm. you know things of that nature. Uh, the hunters, I believe, will take their game and process it and pay for it themselves. As far as food pantries goes, I don't know who processes it, who butchers them, but I, I guess it's a question of mine, but I don't expect you to know that. But I do appreciate your passion for this. I really do. And, and I, too, hate to see something like this happen. I really do. But uh, and let me ask you this, Natalie. You said it would have to be done annually, and I heard the explanation. Right. Where do you have an example where this has been done, where that population has increased? Or... We can provide that information to you. It is, um, you know, in scientific studies, the phenomenon I spoke to um, is is documented throughout, um, you know, not just in deer calls and deer population management, but just an, a natural phenomenon. Yeah. Um, yeah, I find that one hard to believe. I really do. But I'm not disputing your 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 claim. But I, I'd have to see that. To be honest with you, and I'd love to know the expense. Do you have any idea of the expense to say, say, a hundred deer? Have to Shannon, be. you can probably speak to this, but I do want to say that we spoke to the country's leading expert that does both calls and non-lethal management. He does both and hybrids. Um, and we offered them as a resource to the mayor's office to answer some of these questions. And to our knowledge, they did not reach out to this person. So we have provided opportunities to have those questions answered that have not been taken up right. as far as we know right and, and when you say that i guess i'm you're assuming that the deer population in say riverview park is the deer population we come and we spay them they grow old they die naturally and they're no, not able to reproduce but i think it fluctuates i know in my own backyard there's a different set of deer that come in and out all the time. There are the usuals though, um, you know, the ones, again, I feed them, if you ever wanna feed a deer Ritz crackers, they love them. So, uh, so, so you know, so I, I, I guess I have a hard time with understanding non-lethal and the expense of it. Do you have any idea what would it cost to come in and do that? No, because even if you have a city of the exact same, say, um, square mileage and exact same deer numbers, mm. which we don't even know that answer, right? The topography right. makes it, I mean, if you're trying to scale 
Mount Washington to get a deer that you just started. It's a very different kind of, um, you know, it just expense in all of the different equipment that you need and the experts that you need and things like that versus if you're going to be like in my backyard in Brookline, for example. Yeah. You live in um, Brookline? I do, yeah. yes. Yeah. So. Your constituent. <laughs> you um, see deer probably, I'll bet you. In, in and yes, I do. Area. And I live next to a wooded area. And yes. it makes me nervous that I could get hit by a bow. It does, um, right. That's so, my main concern. I, tell you. Yeah. I, I, was, I was particularly concerned when um, the answer to the question of how will these areas be sequestered off was maybe mm -hmm. Department of Public Works or something. I don't think that yeah. that question was answered appropriately. Yeah. Well, you um, know, Shannon, I would like to um, get further answers on that as well. Again, there are so many ways in and out of these patches of woods. Mm -hmm. um, unless you have a, you know, the circumference completely kind of, mm -hmm. you know, secured by park rangers or however we plan to do that, um, I, I just, you know, in, in the one particular place is 300 plus acres of Greenway mm -hmm. in my district. Beachview area, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I can't imagine. I mean, you could come in a thousand different ways, and and if it's not super secure, somebody, some kids. I used to build shacks. I spent half my childhood down there. Uh, we had ways in and out. You'd never, you'd never see us probably. So, so that is my my biggest concern. Um, the only, and had I known about the non-lethal, and if I saw facts in front of me that the expense that it would cost, I would consider that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, if there's one thing that today's discussion has shown is that this is being too rushed. We do need more time to engage in these conversations with you all and with the people who spoke from the city and the other stakeholders. Right. Um, and then the advantage, I would say, versus non-lethal versus lethal is that we're providing food to people where the non-lethal way we would not be. Not to say that's the difference maker for me but it's just you know one small portion of it okay well listen i appreciate your passion uh you know i'll be supporting it today i think the rush is i don't know you know why it took so long to get to our table but rush is obviously deer season coming up and you know whether it's one day six days however many days i think they want to have it in place for then so so again thank you i appreciate you being here thank you councilwoman warwick uh, yeah so Yeah, so just quickly, because I do, I mean, this question of who is requiring the pilot and what is the purpose, you know, why do we have to do a pilot? I think that is a very good question that we haven't answered yet. I, I do think a, a, a number of the other things I've heard, again, I've read things too, right, that say birth control is more expensive, doesn't really work, like, I, but I don't want to speculate because, because I've read something, you know or someone I would rather so for those questions again like the why I, I do want to wait until we have the deer management task force folks up who actually do have some numbers to provide about number of deer etc so at any rate um, uh, but if we could have uh, perhaps Chief Frank again uh, and I, I don't know who else would be best positioned to, to answer sort of who is required like the legality of it why do we need a pilot Yes, sure, sure, because that, that would be nice to know. Like, what is this, like, why do we need to have a pilot? Is it the state who's requiring it? All of that. Yeah. On down. You're the next contestant. Uh, do, do you want to start, John? Um, Introdu I, introduce yeah, yourself. Introduce yourself. John yeah. Farman. I am the park ranger supervisor here for the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. So, yeah, so why, so, you know, who is requiring the pilot? Why do we need to do a pilot? You know, why are we proceeding in this way? First with the pilot, which, which has been acknowledged already at the table, is not going to reduce our deer population. So why do we need the pilot? And then what is the pilot, right? Is it to show that we can do this without screwing it up? And, you know, like, what is the purpose of the pilot for those and who is requiring it? I would say the, the pilot's more of a test run for, for us. Um, obviously, the USDA does this all the time. 
Um, they do this in different municipalities um, within Pennsylvania. They do this all over the place. Um, and this actually just gives us the ability to test run and do it the right way. Um, I think that's the most important part. Uh, we picked uh, Riverview Park and we picked Frick Park um, based on the areas that the parks are in. Um, Shunley Park, for example, that, that can be for next year or the year after, depending on how long this pilot is. Um, those, those are heavy wooded areas, um, specifically being that there are restricted areas within those parks. So basically, um, we will have parameters set up in the parks where you can have no hunting zones. And we want to basically have it specific um, where we have full control over the hunting, um, if that's allowed, you know? Th that makes sense, but let's just, just to keep to the yeah. questions at hand. So why don't we stick to, so, and then who, who is requiring the pilot? Like, why do we need to do this pilot? To, to be certified by the game commission as an entity that can engage in, uh, I don't, I don't know what to call it, full-blown deer management. And it, and it felt a little bit like a catch-22 for us, right? Because yeah. you can't get permission to do deer management unless you've done a little deer management. And so what we'd like to be in a position to do next year is make our application to the Game Commission to, to be, I don't know, certified, to be a fully capable deer management entity. And to do that, we need to do a little bit of a deer management. And it, it is stumped us for a while that we have to do the thing that we, uh, that the commission want. So, I mean, that, that is the short answer. To, to your question also about, you know, I, I, I know there's been a lot of concern about why so quickly, why so quickly. I mean, what the rangers shared with me is that their expectation is that the deer population will double in a year. And so getting this box checked and behind us so that we can engage, we can debate, we can talk about how to do it, we can have a lot of questions about that, but getting this box checked as our deal of population is doubling is important to put us into a position with the state of Pennsylvania to do deer management of any variety. Um, and uh, then the other question uh, is, well, I, I, and I don't know if the right people are at the table at this point to answer, and if not, just say so, and we'll address it in the next group. Um, is, you know, to answer your question, why, well, was non-lethal considered, and if, if not, why not? Right, non-lethal, no. It, it, it was absolutely considered, and I, I know we had this conversation and um, uh, checked with a lot of experts. I think the, the DART method my understanding is is not legal in the state of Pennsylvania. So that's off the table. Sorry, Chief, not legal? Not legal in the state of Pennsylvania. So that leaves us with a sterilization program. That runs about $1,500 a deer. And so in, with the experts that we spoke to, the most, um, uh, I guess, just straight up feasible thing that we would do would be, a, uh, uh, I think you said it, um, uh, Councilman Strasburger would be to do culling to get ourselves into a position where we could move into management through some kind of you know sterilization or birth control program, but that we did not think we would ever really have sufficient funds to get to a manageable population um, just by doing surgical sterilization. It's about it's about fifteen hundred dollars a year. Um, okay, and then also just to address, so I did. I mean, well and we can do, and maybe we'll come back to this a little bit, but as far as the how is it going to work, now I'll say I, I was sort of under the assumption that in order to begin any of this process, sitting down with the USDA, how is this going to work, lay it out, where is it going to be, what time is it going to be, like when are we going to do it and how are we going to get these people lined up and make sure that it, like none of that can happen until this is approved. Is that my understanding? The, the USDA, understandably, would like us to enter into a contract to get to work on executing on the scope. And given the length of deer season, and, and I will also share, they, they were flexible with us. Um, everyone was, was sort of gone when they sent over the contract, and I think they said this needs to be, we need to have this contract in place to begin that planning 
with you to get the website up for the qualifications to do all of these things. We need the contract, I believe, Jonathan, correct me if I'm wrong, but August 10th. And I called him and said, well, that's not really something the city of Pittsburgh can do. And would you work with us if we um, said we will make this the first order of business and we under understanding that that is going to create some discomfort. Un I mean, truly understanding that is going to create some discomfort. But we are really right up to their last um, possible day to be able to execute a contract. So to answer your question succinctly, yes, the, the importance of moving to a contract is to begin to work through the details because that planning is work and we need to pay them. Uh, I think that's no further questions for me on this round. Okay. I did. Just if it's we're up to second round. Anyone else first round? Councilman Wilson. So this is the first time I'm learning it's gonna happen in Riverby Park. So well, <laughs> uh, it's kind of odd since that's in my district. Um, so just to, yeah. So I would like to have been informed a little sooner, especially when this was coming about. This would take place around the residence. Um, that uh, so I'm just going to state that. But given that, um, I'm curious to know, um, and this was more directed at departments. Um, rather than experts. I do have some questions for experts, but I'm not sure if there's any experts in the room on the um, success of calls, if anyone could speak to that. Like, is anyone in the room? I'm not an expert, but I've had extensive conversations with the, the PA Game Commission, and they recommend that this is the best way to do it. Um, now we could probably get uh, someone from the PA Game Commission to come in and speak with you directly, mm. um, but they are the experts. Uh, they do this for a living. Um, the USDA uh, works with them hand in hand. They are the experts. Um, I would say that we're, we're trying to learn how to be an expert. Um, this is why we're uh, working and partnering with the USDA and the Game Commission on how to be experts. Um, but this is the one thing that they constantly say, regardless if we talk to a game warden, if we talk to someone from the PA Game Commission, that this is the number one way to reduce deer population within the state. Okay, so in terms of the, the number that's been thrown around, whether it's 50, so there hasn't been any count. And if anyone's in the room that has done the count, I'll be interested to hear from them, but there is a number of deer. So let me just state, like, the, the majority of my residents want it. What I'm trying to understand, is, and I want to support that, what I'm trying to understand is just so we're all on the same page with this because even information that they're telling, like residents are reaching out about, I'm not sure if that's gonna, I just wanna know if it's gonna solve the problem. So here's a lot of things that I hear. Deer, ha deer are the major reason for, um, uh, you know, people getting Lyme disease. Deer are causing um, the, you know, the, they're eating the saplings, they're eating the, the brush, um, you know, has that been, other than just like hearsay and just like saying I've lived in the city since the 70s, you know, what are, what are has anyone really, is anyone in the room here? Have they counted? Are, they, are we going to like count when the foliage comes back or the brush comes back? I'm just trying to understand if there's like a briefing that we can have to understand this more deeply, to understand if we're actually going to solve the problem, the problems that we're seeing by a deer call. I don't know who they are, though. So I'm hearing that there are some people in the room that could answer those questions. Mm -hmm. 
we can make room. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm interested to talk to yeah, we can people that have room. expertise in this. We need, I'm not sure. We can bring another chair up, can't we? I, I can go back. Shannon can speak, I think, okay. on our behalf. Thank you. Appreciate it, Natalie. Thank you. Come on up, Marty. Sure. Whatever you... Here, can I help bring a chair in? If you could state your name and and uh, uh, affiliation or expertise to, to the, this matter, like some of those credentials would be good. My name is Martha Eisler. I'm the president of the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition, mm. and we passed a resolution a year ago that required us to look into the issues that were concerning our residents, and that was the deer overpopulation, the number of deer in our parks and also on our streets. Mm. And we began to look into the situation and found that over the last five years, the number of dead deer picked up by animal control in the city of Pittsburgh has increased from 335 in 2018 to over 500 last year. Where'd you get that number? From animal control. From Pittsburgh animal control. Pittsburgh animal control. I got it over and, the and phone. And the number was what again? 500. 335 in 2018, steadily increasing to over 500 in 2022. Now, I can't get that in writing. I had to submit right to know, but that's what they told me over the phone. I have the mm. statistics. The state also picks up another 99 dead deer on city streets for the last five years. So we're looking at really over 600. Getting information on collisions is difficult because it's under comprehensive, according to the State Insurance Commission. It's not reported as a deer collision. So we don't have citywide numbers, but we do have some national studies that have been done. And as to the numbers of deer, the last study that was done in the city of Pittsburgh was 2010, and it was and in four of our parks, Frick, Shenley, Highland, and Riverview. And at that time, the deer overpopulation was, well, the numbers were into four to six times what it should be to maintain a population, and that was 2010. And if you consider that deer double in population every two or three years, we're looking at a serious overpopulation, but nothing has been done with cameras and with surveying and with daily going back to track the numbers since 2010. So that- So what was done in 2010 to track the number? Pardon me? What was done in 2010 to track the number? They had cameras set up mm -hmm. in the park and they had- And who's they? The USDA. Okay, they came and- It was brought in by the, the city to do it. The city, at the, yeah. Yes. I definitely wasn't here. <laughs> you were here. Well. I was chair of the Shade Tree Commission at the time, mm -hmm. and we were concerned because of our young trees that were trying to repopulate our parks and our tree canopy. They were being eaten faster than we could replant them. And we had all kinds of strategies to um, put tubes around them and fence them and do everything we could, and really, seriously, nothing worked. And we weren't able to get the issue of deer management to city council at that time. Uh, we were kind of shut off before we got to the door. But in the last year, we have been working, providing information to the mayor's office. Our council people obviously have been very involved in Squirrel Hill. I have a partner in Riverview Park because that seemed to be one of the worst. Back in 2010, it was the highest density of deer, and too. What was the density then? It was, I think, 66 instead of the 10 that it was supposed to be. I can give you this. Per square eight, oh, for, square. For, for, for the park itself. Square acre. 
And Kate St. John, who was a birder and is, <coughs> spends a lot of time in Chenley and Frick Park, she has taken a lot of the data that we've been collecting over the last mm. year and put it together in a format that we hope is easy for everybody to understand. And we did send it to the city clerk so that you could all see it. But what, what are the signs of too many deer? And since Kate is more of an expert in terms of the over-browsing and what it does to the understory and what it does to um, our birds and nesting and our small creatures, I'd like to turn it over to Kate. And she's well, in I, our Protect Our Parks. Mm -hmm. Well, I have some more questions about the, the numbers. So I'm looking at this. So in 2010, it's from 2010. 2010. So this is uh, estimated density is 53. Shanley 66, um, and this is per quarter mile, square acre. Sorry, I just can't. I think the bottom line is when you get to the recommendation, mm -hmm. they were, USDA was saying, basically you need a deer management program. And at that time, as I said, we worked with the mayor's office, we worked with public works. I say we, mm -hmm. we, it, we was then the, uh, the Shade mm -hmm. Tree Commission. And we just couldn't get it, the conversation off the dime. Nobody wanted to even have a conversation publicly about it. So, so have you had conversations about like the vacuum effect that could happen in terms of, you know, I think some of it was mentioned here, but also just like, I mean, the parks are not like green spaces. I live on Spring Hill and I have about five deer in the back of my yard every day. So, um, I mean, well, that's not a park there. Well, I live a half a block from Murray Avenue on Darlington, and mm -hmm. I have three deer who mm -hmm. come by my house and chomping along the way to get to who knows where because they cut mm -hmm. down towards Forbes. So Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering, like, it's, so is this, are you, so if we take care of, if, if there are deer that are called in the, in the parks here that have these numbers, and we track that, and then... We'll, I don't know is if there's a plan to contract with the USDA again to then see if the numbers have decreased. But even if that does decreases, what's stopping the deer population to continue to grow in our green spaces? Well, there is a spillover effect. And I'm not an expert in this, but what we understand is that when from other cities that we have contacted is that when you control the parks, and get to a balance in the parks, which isn't going to happen overnight, according to everyone that we've talked to. The balance takes years to get to because we're so overpopulated. It's not as if we can just cull 10% of the deer population and expect that balance. It's, it's not going to happen for, certainly for a number of years. But once you get to the balance, and then once you, you implement an, an effective deer management program in your parks, then that spillover effect doesn't happen to your green spaces and your public streets and all else that happens. You do reduce vehicle collisions, for example. In every city we've studied, when they've implemented a deer management plan, mm. they have, in fact, reduced deer vehicle collisions. When you implement a deer management plan, they have reduced the number of spillover deer into our residential streets into our greenways, into the other parklet areas that we have. So it's a, um, it's a proven strategy from the cities that we have studied and from what we've gained from the Game Commission. We've, we've been in contact with the warden and uh, what other Pennsylvania cities, but also what other cities throughout the country are doing. For example, Cleveland has a park system very similar to ours with four major parks and they were one of the ones that we contacted. Um, I, I'd like to turn it over to Kate because she has a lot of the information. She's been going into uh, looking at the devastation for 20 years, so she can begin to tell you what the over-browsing actually does to the park. Before we do that, and um, since you're, I mean, um, you said that you formed a committee and um, and you've been talking to the experts at the USDA, and who else have you consulted with? Well, the that, that would be experts in the field. The biologist at the Game Commission, mm -hmm. um, the warden. We've talked to the 
the warden who was assigned to us, to our area. Mm -hmm. We work with the park rangers. We've contacted, we have a vet on our committee who was affiliated with Penn. And we've just gone to as many places as we can to gather information that would enable us to draft and recommend to the city a deer management plan, mm -hmm. which would be ongoing. And as was pointed out, it, it has to happen every year. It, because of the way deer populate or progeny every year, two or three, we have to do it every year. Mm. Mm. All right. Okay, I'll, I'm going to speak to why Pittsburgh has a, an overpopulation of deer. And this is based on the habitat and, um, but I'll first introduce the fact that uh, how they reproduce, okay? So and they, what's your expertise? Um, I'm a birder, a naturalist. I've been following the um, deer and their effect on birds and the habitat. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Thank you. Um, Kate St. John, I live in North Oakland. I used to live in Greenfield and um, I'm a birder, a naturalist. I've been following the deer uh, problem and how it affects uh, Pennsylvania and now Pittsburgh since 1998. Um, but I'm, I am primarily a birder, so I see the effect on birds. Um, and deer have an effect on their entire habitat, as anybody in the habitat would. So um, when they reach an overpopulation point, um, it happens rapidly. They, um, every year, 98% of the does are bred. So there's very few does that aren't pregnant. Uh, in the city and suburbs, 40% of the fawns breed before they're a year old. So they have, uh, they give birth when they're a year old. And 85% of the pregnancies are twins or triplets. So they double their population every two to three years. And so whatever number you're seeing there, and this is, that doubling includes, that's, those are all numbers from the Game Commission, that doubling includes the deaths, so it's just how many we have. Um, so I started looking hard at Shenley Park in 2008 um, and documenting what I saw. Um, and uh, now that we are, it, they've been doubling for a long time. Um, at first, they were hard to notice, uh, but now you can walk through Shenley Park. I can <clears throat> show you eight-point bucks hanging out together this month, and, so, but what they are eating. You want to know what they're eating? Yeah, how do we know they're eating the, okay. what, what we're saying they're so eating? So I have photos of them eating, and I have videos of them eating, and um, they browse. But there's been, has there been any discussion as to, like, other factors why that would be happening? Um, when you take somebody who knows what they're looking at to look at it, they, the trees that are growing from the ground are like bonsai because in the winter, deer don't have leaves to eat. They eat the twigs. So all the, um, they're, and then at this season, they're, and also in the winter, they're browsing the trees up. So they reach as high as they can and pull down leaves and twigs and eat them. So if you go through any of our parks, especially Shenley or Riverview, there's nothing growing between the ground and the height of a deer. And you can see straight through the forest. And when you can see that, that is a sign of deer because nothing else, does, rabbits can't get that high. Um, nothing else does that. Um, and I have in a PowerPoint, I have, uh, series of photos that show the effects of deer browse and they have moved out of the parks and uh, one of the favorite things they eat is yew which is a kind of shrub um, a shrub that is not eaten grows normally uh, if you look at the shrub the yew shrubs behind frick fine arts in oakland at carnegie museum as you drive into the parking lot you see twiggy looking wood and then hidden behind that are the ewes and that that's has been shown thing. that other cities who do a deer call 
that the growth comes back in an expected time? Um, I think Marty can speak to that better, but I do know that it, the, I'm speaking for the forest in saying this kind of pressure is not good for the forest or the plants or, the, or anything that relies on them. And it's not good for the deer because now they are trying to eat poisonous plants. They are eating things they don't like. There's no native plants left. And there's nothing for them, nowhere for them to hide. When a doe drops a fawn, she has to hide it. There's nowhere to hide. So what's the expected time for the growth to come back? If you have the population right, then the growth will come. The, there's a deer exclosure in Frick Park that shows you that outside the exclosure, there's nothing growing, um, especially if you look at it in, say, April. Outside the exclosure, nothing on the ground. Inside the, excl the exclosure where the deer can't be, mm. there's stuff growing. Yeah, we were going to do that in Riverview. I'm not sure if that ever got installed as part of a P2SA project. Um, but I was interested to see what would happen there. So it would be lovely to set could, up. Some. You know, that yeah. hasn't gotten installed yet. But we recently was... took a a tour of no. Riverview, no. and you have that stilt grass, which is fluffy, and I think it's called stilt grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 fluffy yeah. and green, and it's an invasive actually. Mm -hmm. And that's all there is. There's no native plants left, mm. and what we know from these enclosures that um, Kate was talking about is that when you see them side by side, you can tell if the deer have been kept out, there are native plants and the little trees that we're trying to, native trees, not invasive trees, but native, they are actually coming back in these enclosures. And it's something that we can prove to you through photographs that it will work if we can reduce the deer population. Mm. Yeah, I just want to be mindful of the, the goals that we have here. And the pilot just seems like a pilot that is um, one that will let us know if we're effective at reducing the population. But we don't have the numbers currently. So we'll, we'll be, well, I guess we'll be subtracting on what we have. And then we'll be making the count. I'm sorry, do you know this information? We'll be making the well, count. My understanding um, from the talking to the deer biologist is that this pilot that we're calling it, this demonstration, shows us how we're going to proceed going forward and telling the Game Commission that we are capable of doing right. this. And then that becomes just the trigger that allows us to submit to the Game Commission an overall deer management plan, which has to then include all of the options that we're talking about and possibly get their approval and then go full force into 24 for all of our parks, not just the two demonstrations. So I don't believe from everything that I've heard that we will have any kind of data that will tell us reductions mm. or that will show us that yeah, other we're like, than- we're like getting our certification. Right, other than how to do it mm. seems to me what the Game Commission wants us to prove so that we can then maybe get some cameras in, get some numbers going, and begin to s survey where we are and where we're going. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, thanks for sharing the, <laughs> the paper here. Oh, <laughs> anytime. We yeah. also provided you, Kate, <laughs> put together a lot of our pictures and our data that we've been collecting over the last year. I don't. We didn't yeah, I haven't seen it. You haven't? It, see it. I sent it to the I city clerk. I, I sent it to the city clerk and asked that it be distributed to you, but if um, well, I can yeah. certainly get it to you directly. It probably yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, just, you know, once again, I've had multiple uh, residents reach out. Every, everyone is, is, is uh, you know, in favor of this. I just feel that it's, um, I, I just think it's our, all of us sitting here, our responsibility to have more of a robust conversation about this. And so I'm just concerned about the, um, you know, about the, the timing of this, of why it's, you know, why we can't have briefings, understand more deeply on 
like how we're going to have a more robust um, plan to solve the issues, not just, um, you know, not just uh, by way of the call. You know, there's other, mm -hmm. uh, have you looked at other strategies other than? We, we know, did, and, and our vet helped us. Like, like what's going to come alongside the, um, you know, the call? Like, would we, say we get certified, and then we have these hunts that are, I'm not sure how often it would take place, but whatever that, whatever that number is, then there, there, it seems like there should be something that goes alongside that to make sure that, you know, we're taking care of the parks appropriately, not just, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not fully, um, I don't fully understand. I don't fully have the understanding to know that this is going to solve all the problems that people are emailing me about. Um, and I'm just concerned about that. Like, I, like if, if there's a, a problem to solve, you know, I'd like to be involved in those conversations to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm just not seeing that. And, but I want to be supportive of what, you know, everyone uh, has, has uh, you know, the work you've done um, and be mindful of, you know, your, um, you know, what, what, you've, what you've been discussing or what you've been, the examples you've been giving, expertise being, you've been given or the, what you've, um, you know, what your organization believes should happen. I just wish we had more time to flush this out. I think and, the time. And, and, I, and I think that the time, uh, you know, I understand like this hunting season is coming up. It's like we just found out that, you know, that hunting season happens um, or that we need to get certified to do this. I think that's I, the... I just think that, you know, we could have more of a robust conversation, a post agenda with, you know, the yeah. wildlife experts that you all talk to right. sitting here in front yeah. of us and, yeah. and we can ask the appropriate questions just so yeah. the public isn't being misled at all. Yeah. I think that's because, when the, because, when because the I think plan? that whenever other people talk to the right. the expert, it can it can get um a little bit confusing, right? And, and everyone is talking right. about yeah, yeah. And everyone is talking. I, sorry, sorry. I just want to finish my thought. Sorry, here. sorry. And everyone is um everyone else is talking to the experts, and I feel that right. it would be our duty here to talk to those individuals so that we're fully aware of uh the potential and the consequences of what's going to happen here. Yeah. And I just think we're not doing justice by, by doing that. I think everyone is interested in solving this problem. I have no doubt in that. I just wish that we flush this out more and we're more strategic in our plan here. Right. Thanks. Um, yeah. So I don't uh, have any I, further questions. Sorry. I apologize. apologize. Uh, me. Oh, I've got Councilwoman Gross next. Can I, oh, oh, you do have to wait sorry. to be asked the question. Oh, I do. I do. Sorry. Oh, okay. I thought I thought we were working down the. So sorry, I apologize. Um, I'd like to pick up on that thread because we we can still have a post agenda, and so maybe yeah. you know that it seems would like be it happens right. After. I, it should. Yeah, it's out of sequence for that. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think we should because it doesn't seem actually like there is a completely fleshed out plan, honestly, right? So it seems like we still don't know exactly yeah. the yeah. footprints, the time frames, the goal, again, kind of like, have we established, and maybe it's in your report, I apologize that Ken yeah. the council members didn't receive the report, I didn't receive the report, I just checked my email. Um, kind of where is, what is our baseline? Um, and it does seem like photographs of the actual uh, you know, plants in these specific areas compared year over year could be something that we can see evidence of an improvement in a very limited area. We may not see that improvement since this is such a small pilot program. Um, I also, I think I heard enough to t definitely make me want to find out more about the non-lethal methods and is there a way to combine both of these to get to a, a level right that we're trying to aim at even though we kind of we aren't even talking numbers about like what is this we're not even confident of the numbers that we have of what levels we're trying to achieve um, and then um, I, I don't think we don't have the right people at the table yet to still revisit the kind of weapons that are being used mm -hmm. again bows is not descriptive enough all the compound bows do travel quite some distance. And we, we'll definitely, I think, as council, want to hear more about the safety precautions and the, 
the footprints and how these are being protected. Um, and there's, I think, a lot, a lot, lot longer conversation, as Councilman Wilson was saying, about really getting people to, and, and us, to understand our parks management. And um, we've talked so many times about trying to manage um, and improve invasive species where we're getting, uh, we're losing our native trees and shrubs because of invasive species, but here also we're, we're, we're losing them because of the over browsing by the deer. And then we've heard just a little hint today about how the over browsing by the deer and the loss of that canopy, or it's not really canopy, but the, land, the loss of the, the plants at deer height, that ha has to have an impact on other species, right? And so, yep. you know, the bird populations or other animals that are populations now have no habitat. So it's a loss of habitat for other animal species. Um, so there's just, this is like a really, it's a really big topic. It's a really big topic that we haven't fully fleshed out. So um, I am wondering about the timing. It does seem like the administration is asking for us to rush this vote. And even if we let them get started, that doesn't mean that we're out of the conversation, honestly, right? So we should stay in that conversation in the coming weeks so that we can get these questions answered. And frankly, I think council has the authority to cancel a contract even if it awards one. So there's that too. Not to open a can of worms. I think I just did. <laughs> so there's that. So um, that's all I'm going to have right now, Mr. Chair. And I do, I do see that we have. I want to ask our guest, who's been eager to kind of chime in on one of those issues. I'm, I apologize. I don't think we've heard your name and uh, you've spoken yet. No, um, um, my name is Allison Keating. Um, I'm, Allison, I thank you. If I know you're from emails. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I met with your uh, chief of staff um, okay. when, when when we were when our group was doing some outreach several months ago. Um, I, uh, can I speak? Like, I, yeah, I, I just I, asked I, you, I just I asked you to speak. Oh, okay, all right, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, um, uh, um, yeah, so like, so I'm, I'm kind of well known as a, uh, party pooper. Um, I, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the person who shows up and tells everybody that they're, you know, saying things, um, imprecisely like like deer call is is a specific thing like like a deer call is when you go in and you uh severely deplete the population um that's not what's happening here they're they're doing hunting um it's it, it's different um um i like there there's a lot of things that have been said that have been that uh, you know I would more than ha more than be happy to uh, refute like um, about the sterilization. That's uh, in addition to the birth control that is also not approved by the game commission to do. Um, you know like we could spend fifteen hundred dollars to sterilize every single deer in the city, um, <laughs> and people would wonder why we weren't solving our housing crisis instead. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, um, I have so much information inside of my head, I don't know where to start, but um, a, a, a couple of the things that I can say is that Cincinnati has a very successful program in their, in, in, in their, in their city parks. They also have a program in their county parks. Our county has a program in our county parks. Um, you know, like um, uh, multiple municipalities. Uh, Fox Chapel ha has a program that largely takes place on private property. Um, it, it has successfully decreased the the, the, the deer and car collisions um, in their community, and and that is the primary metric that the suburbs use to explain their program and to justify their program. Um, that is something that we could also do. Um, that you know. That, there are there are just a, a, an amazing. It, it is a very complex topic. Um, um, uh, the the program in New York that that the Humane Action folks were speaking about um, that is on Staten Island. Staten Island is an island. Pittsburgh is not an island. <laughs> um, if we sterilized all the deer in the city, um, deer would come in from the suburbs. Um, I. I uh, um, <laughs> Um, I, uh, in, in terms of the, the quickness of this program, um, was another thing that I, um, I am sometimes referred to as a professional citizen because I go to an awful lot of public meetings and, um, engage with my community, um, and I help people with a lot of things. Um, 
and and what I hear from a lot of my friends who work at the city is that maintenance is, um, is, is, is a consistent issue in the city due to staffing and all different kinds of ways. Um, um, sorry. Um, so are some of the some of this think, um, input reflected in the report we haven't read sorry. yet? Sorry, no, no. Okay. I um, and then also in, in that you, report, I guess I, you're a member of the task force. Uh, Is there another agency yes, that yes. you okay, okay. are so, affiliated so, with? So, so um, I don't think we explained the origin of the task force as well. Like, like, so I'm a member of Friends of Riverview, and 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 we um, we. Um, we have been push, pushing on this issue since we were founded, and um, I heard about uh, the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition doing doing their advocacy in the fall, and I reached out to Marty, and then we started this program just in January, okay. and 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 we started this because we knew that n none of the nonprofits wanted to do this. No one wanted to be the lead on this, um, you know, and 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 so so you know we used our 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 knowledge and our um, you know. Uh, you know, just all of, you know, I, I, I reached out to people who I've worked on, you know, like ecological issues throughout the city, you know, like Tree Pittsburgh, uh, Goatscape, and, you know, and, and, and just got everyone involved. And, uh, you know, we started sharing information and having meetings. And, you know, and then, and then the, you know, uh, folks who work at the city started getting involved. And that's, and that's how we engage, started to engage with the rangers. Um, we are the ones who uh, encourage the rangers to reach out to USDA. Um, you know, like that, that, that's the connection that we made. We, we, we helped this happen because, you know, we saw that it wasn't happening otherwise. Um, city, city budgets are, you know, like just so tight and, and th things that get done are based on how much money is, how much money, and then therefore staff is, 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 is given to them. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, so like this didn't have anyone on the inside who was staffed who was dealing with it, so it wasn't getting done until like three months ago. So like, you know, and anyway, so, so, so I, also our protocol so is like, that yeah. only I can ask you questions while I have Sorry. the floor. So I'm just going to put you on pause. Apologize. Apologize. So in case other members have questions for Sorry. you, Apologize. I'm going to just tell Mr. Chair that's all, that's all my questions. And then, okay. and then we, we give Mr. Right. Chair the, the control here. We've Apologize. got second round, Councilman Cross, followed by Councilman Strasburg. Okay, thank you. So um, this, is, this is what I love about what we do here and that we can, we can come together in, in some level of commonality, discuss the, the issues that are before us and try to craft, hopefully, some sense of solution. If there's any one thing that I'm hearing um, from the discussion today is through the, the process of lack of action for now decades, we have all been diminished regardless of what role we may play in this conversation, we have all been diminished. Uh, and that we find ourselves now at critical mass. And so we are crafting strategy just to get us through critical mass, which will only get us through critical mass and no further. And next year we'll be back here again asking the same questions and, uh, and trying again, uh, unsuccessfully, hopefully not, um, to find a, a comprehensive yearly uh, wildlife management plan across the city. And so what does that look like? Um, what shape does it take? What are the budgetary impacts of it? And how do we start, right? Every journey is one step, right? Every fiesta collection is one cup. Really, that's inside <laughs> baseball, um, oh, and um, uh, and that is that is the challenge we're faced with, and unfortunately, no, maybe fortunately, what's coming out of this conversation is that this council may want to uh, want to have another moment to to clear our heads, and and understand the challenge holistically understand the challenge before us and what is being asked of us to do. Are we going to just react to this moment in time um, and do this call, if that is the right 
terminology uh, uh, and uh, without any clear comprehensive strategy for long-term uh, long wildlife management across the city and what those budgetary impacts are and how we plan for them. Uh, Jonathan, there was one thing that you said about this, this the USDA says this is the best solution. Uh, but uh, my question for you is it the, does the USDA say this is the best solution because of the situation we are in, or is that holistic, across the board, comprehensive statement saying, yes, calling is your most effective strategy? And you can, can we bring them, can, so, yeah. we, I bet if we just, we can bring them in. I, I Thank think you. to answer your question, it's, it's more of like a holistic thing. Um, it's more of things that have been proven all over the country. It's not just a Pittsburgh problem. It's not like a Pennsylvania problem. It's all over the United States. Um, so that's that's kind of where it's coming from. Y yes, but um, what is the what is the best solution? I guess is my question. Just simply calling, or hunting, or is it hunting? It, really? Uh, yeah, hunting would be the best solution. Um, I mean, it won't happen overnight, but it's over time. Um, I'm going to call out the USDA on that one because I think I'm going to call BS on that. I just don't know okay. that a strategy is allowed to let a species overpopulate to the point to that the only solution is just to go out and slaughter. I think there has to be better ways to do this. I think over, over time, um, when we kind of let things go um, and not saying it was anyone here at the table or anyone right. in other administrations. I think over time, this whole situation transpired and multiplied. Um, and we're in the situation today. And I, I feel like we have to start somewhere. Um, and this might be the somewhere where we need to start. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's something that has been developing since there was a study in 2010, um, I'm sure other directors were pondering about this. Other council mm -hmm. members have been pondering about this. Um, and I feel like we're at this point where it's a tipping point, like someone said earlier, that we're, we're here now and it would be great to start at some point, uh, hopefully soon. So I've known Marty forever, and I trust Marty, and I appreciate what she's brought to the table today and the, and, and the efforts and energies that she's put into this over how many years were you saying now? Maybe 10 years, more? I remember Maybe your 15. appointment to the Shade Tree Commission. So, uh, I mean, again, I, 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 I reiterate my, my remarks of the, of the consistent lack of action across multiple administrations uh, by those who had power and authority to address the situation has brought us to this moment in time. And it wasn't for lack of petitioning by any means that many people and many dedicated citizens have petitioned their government to take action. Uh, and now we're at a point in time where at least we're being told that our only option is to slaughter. And I would ask the council, perhaps there's a moment of reflection here where we regroup and, and clear our heads and, 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 and perhaps do people like Marty justice by actually putting together a plan that has been asked for for decades. And maybe that is really the challenge that is before this council today. Um, I'll, I'll leave my remarks at that for this moment in time. Thank you. Um, before turning it over to Councilman Strasburger, uh -huh. I just want to use my prerogatives here to chime in for one second to follow up on your comments. I view this in many respects similar to our affordable housing conversation. Um, as you may recall, because you were here, other members weren't. Years ago, I put in a bill that said 30% affordable housing in any specially planned district in the city. And I then went to the Planning Commission and admitted, I don't know if this is the right thing to do. I know we have a problem. I know we need to do something about it, but I don't know if this is right, right? 
that we then tabled that bill in favor of ultimately bringing forward and creating the affordable housing task force to which we then studied and figured out, okay, here's what needs to be happening. Here's how many units short. Here's the strategies of the, which we then ultimately created the housing opportunity fund. We, we've done the bond. And so we've done all these other things that sort of came out of, of an initial moment. I view this as that sort of similar thing, which is we've got to do something. And then after we do this initial thing, let's then spend time to your point, Councilman Krause, of really wrapping our collective minds around how we're going to tackle this. Because right now we're just talking about the parks. My real concern is all the deer in the streets. Um, but that's for us to collectively think through with all the appropriate parties to go down that road to come up with a full plan a year from now so that we can have a comprehensive thing in place. So I just want to give my perspective on why I'm comfortable moving this forward. Councilwoman Schrossberger. Thank you. I, um I, you know, I really agree with both of you. Um, Councilman Kraus, I respect you greatly, and it's amazing how similar our thought process is with regard to the questions that need to be answered, the conversation that still needs to be had, even our own personal constitution. If anyone has ever lived with me, they know that I'm the person who catches the spider and releases it outside because I can't stand to kill a spider. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's so much similarity there. I. Um, I have questions, and many of us still ha have questions with regard to the notification to council offices around the timing of, of this all happening, and, and what will the notification to residents look like? So that, to you know, Councilman Coghill's concern, we're not seeing the kid running down from Somerset for, from Frick Park into the you know Frick Park accidentally uh, when this is occurring. Um, that's my major concern as well. Um, perhaps we do need a post agenda or a set of briefings. Um, briefings with maybe coordinated by a designated council member who can work with the administration and everyone outside of the city who's working on this. Um, we do need to understand our ongoing maintenance plan, um, not just this year, but on an annual basis. And I think actually ask the question if there's a need for additional legislation rather than internal policy to compel a regular report or revisiting of the maintenance plan so we understand exactly what is, um, what, is, uh, what is happening and the effectiveness of this. I don't know, I don't wanna add bureaucracy to the process, but I also know mm -hmm. we need to know if we're succeeding in this. So all of those questions have to be asked. And yet, I come to the conclusion that Councilman Lavelle comes to, which is that we need to take the first step. I would recommend passing this, both bills today um, related to this topic and taking that first step so that we can continue the conversation rather than ending it, um, but not kicking the can further down the road so that in 2024, we're just back here having talked a lot about it, having perhaps solidified kind of both sides of this issue without actually having taken action. I would feel a lot better about taking some sort of action with questions remaining than, than not taking action today and missing our opportunity to do so in coordination with uh, USDA. Councilman Warwick. Um, yeah, so, well, I actually have, well, one, one thing I did want to note, because I got a, I got a note from uh, Rebecca Ranallo, just a note that, uh, that the city has had more than 600 311s regarding deer, and that is without even a category in the 311 drop down for deer. So that's just to kind of give a little bit of perspective to from the from the residents. Um, I, I agree too, and I'm, I'm happy. And once once this plan is in place, I mean, you know, once we are at the point where we actually know how this is going to work, I'm more than happy to call a post agenda because that, I mean, without a doubt, just for safety, that needs to be clear. We need to understand it, and then the public needs to understand it, obviously, um, including the outreach, right? <coughs> including how we're going to let people know. So um, I'm, I'm happy to to support that time, when when the time promise. comes, which I think will be soon, right? I mean, this is this is all happening soon. Um, I. Is there anyone after me on the list? Because I want to make sure that everyone gets to have questions answered from this group. Because I actually would like to call Director Schmidt because I have a little bit of a, of a side turn that I'd like to bring up that I think Director Schmidt can answer. Unless we want to squeeze another chair. Oh, yeah. 
Well, and, and you obviously bring people back if needed. For, certainly. For we can certainly let our current guests go. Thank you all for okay. being here. Yeah. Yes, thank Hang you. Hang around just in much. case there's another round Please. of conversation. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just in case. Thank you. So, yeah, if, if, uh, if Director Schmidt could come to the table. I complicated things bringing in that extra chair. Oops. Director, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good, welcome. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, well, I guess introduce yourself for the. Uh, Lee Schmidt, I'm a public safety director for the city. Yeah, so, so my question is, and we got uh, a very, we, we got a bunch of emails. I, don't, I think maybe this one came to all of us through the clerk, I'm not sure, um, but it was one particular email that I think made some very good points, and that was this, is that, you know, here we are tackling this deer issue um, at, at, you know, in order to protect our parks and at the behest of many residents in neighborhoods like Squirrel Hill and such, when um, the fact is we have enormous numbers of requests for folks to deal with raccoons and such in their homes that are in you know far less affluent mm -hmm. communities we get lots of raccoon requests and all we can do is trap and we don't have enough traps and it is you know and <laughs> i think deer are beautiful i think raccoon are terrifying <laughs> and if i had one in my house i would flip out right so just to take a little bit of a sidetrack, because I know that at the end of last year, um, we moved some 200K out of animal control and into uh, something for police equipment, I don't recall. So I just wanted to check in very quickly on that. So, so in light of this deer management program and this, you know, what we are embarking on today, sort of where are we in terms of animal control and raccoon management and is there an option to more effectively <laughs> deal with what is a very real problem with raccoons mm -hmm. and lots of and and and, and other other animals right Wild rats life. raccoons i mean you name it right Wild so deer are lovely and uh there are some other not so lovely animals that i know that folks would like to <coughs> some help with sure um so regarding the raccoon trapping um, it's not a matter of not having funding for traps. They're actually fairly inexpensive. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of having the staff and the resources to check those traps on a regular basis. So we, because of, I know people consider raccoons a nuisance, um, but we still don't want to be cruel to a raccoon that is caught in a trap. So we need to ensure that if there is a raccoon that ends up in a trap or any animal ends up, because cats can go in those traps, mm -hmm. possums, any variety, groundhogs, any variety of animals that fit inside of those traps can go in those. We need to make sure they're monitored by a homeowner or a resident or somebody. And then they have to contact animal care and control and animal control has to be able to come out in a short period of time to come out and deal with that animal however that process is um, with by state regulations with a raccoon or a groundhog that is euthanasia of that animal um, other animals such as a cat or something like that that would obviously be, be taken to an animal shelter um, but we don't want to leave an animal in there for two or three days without anyone knowing it's in there or without being able to go out there so with Talking to Dave Madden after December of last year, we did talk through that. We do not have the staff on animal care and control to really expand that program at this point. It would require additional staff members that would be able to go out and deal with the animals that were caught in the traps. And then oftentimes, the raccoons are in vacant properties. Um, we can put a trap in the neighbor's yard um, or a neighbor's property, but someone has to be able to, to be there to watch that trap. We can't put it on vacant property just because we don't want someone to not, we don't want an animal to be somewhere and, and die in a, in a cage. 
that makes sense. So yeah, and I understand that I'm not asking for a solution at the yeah, day, yeah. right now. To, but I just it, it was a. But wildlife management in an yeah. urban area is a challenging thing. Um, our animal care and control follows and only deals with city ordinances. We don't have humane animal officers or humane rescue officers because we don't have our own shelter. That's a study that we're working on, um, but we don't have that yet. So we have very limited control in what we're allowed to do as a city. I, I think that's something worth exploring. Um, it's a matter of resources to do all that. Yeah, and I'd say as as is the situation with the deer, right? Like it's very limited what animal control can actually do with right. When it comes to deer, deer, they really have no authority or control right. because that's that's a, a game commission function. Yeah. So so this really was more <clears throat> just to to for who's the person I don't remember their name, but to acknowledge that you know that comment came in. I think it's a very valid comment, and that you know the, these these types of you know that. Wildlife management overall is certainly something that we need to be looking at in a broader, broader spectrum than just just the deer. So, at any rate, that's all for me. Thank you. Third round, Councilman Cross. Thank you. Maybe maybe I'll close it out. Okay, <laughs> I'll do my best to do that. Um, uh, I'm always reminded of uh, then Councilman Peduto uh, and and uh, ultimately Mayor Peduto, Peduto challenging council that budget is a reflection of our priorities. And it is budget season. It's upon us. Here we are. Uh, and this is our golden opportunity uh, to say that this matters, that this is part of our, our priority. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and it is uh, something that we value uh, and that this conversation has brought it to the forefront. So perhaps in closing out the conversation, uh, if we are going to vote, uh, it, it would be to challenge us as the fiduciary agents of the city and the managers of the budget to, to reflect our commitments uh, to a holistic strategy for um, for uh, wildlife management throughout the city, uh, that now's the time to do it. Budget season is upon us, and so I will, uh, I will challenge us and gladly participate uh, in that process if uh, we wish to do so. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. With that, any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 No. Any in opposition? No. One in opposition. Affirmative recommendation on both bills 1845 and 1846. Thanks, everybody, for being here. That takes us to our new paper, Bill 1827. Bill 1827, resolution authorizing Thanks, the issuance of a warrant in favor of Bayer Solutions LLC in an amount not to exceed $8,400 for an advanced train the trainer firearms instruction course. Um, a motion for a brief discussion. Approve. Motion to approve brief discussion. Second. I think that's it. <laughs> discussion, Councilman Cargill. Okay, um, I really don't have any questions. Uh, you know, I know my chief of staff was looking into was this a no bid contract director or not? Do you even know that? I I find it necessary. I think it's the, you know. Um, if you don't mind, I'll bring Absolutely. Lieutenant Palermo from the training academy please, up. He please. can explain what the yes. training was. Yes. And He's been anxiously awaiting to come up. Good. Hey, right, Lieutenant, welcome. Uh, just state your name for the record, and we'll go from there, right? Anthony Palermo, Lieutenant, uh, City of Pittsburgh Police, <clears throat> current training director at the Police Academy. Got it. Um, you want to just fill us in on, you know, the training that we're... Sure. Uh, the, the goal was to offer continuing education to the instructors at the training academy. This year, we were looking at uh, advanced firearms training for our firearms instructor, Cadre. Um, this company, we've, I've had, and some other instructors have had prior classes with them. The level and detail in which they approach the class and the material they deliver um, was appealing to us in terms of taking that material, incorporating, updating curriculum for in-service personnel as well as recruit training 
to, um, in lieu of sending a small amount of instructors out of town or to other courses where room and board is paid, et cetera, to host it here, we could send more instructors and then have that at a centralized location that would benefit, benefit us all for years to come. Right, and Lieutenant Palermo, when you say um, this training, would, would it be exercised at the outdoor firing range that sits in Councilwoman Gross's district, or do they go to neutral sites or other sites for the training? Uh, hosting it, it happens at our training. So, okay, so if we're hosting, it happens at ours, but it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes we go to another training facility to be trained. Or one Correct. Of so, facilities. for instance, uh, September of 2022, three of uh, three, myself and two instructors went to Detroit and Got took it. a class with this Got company. It. Got it. Okay, uh, that's all the questions I have. Thank you, Councilman Gross. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm just going to make you repeat that. So <laughs> how many hours does this add at the outdoor firing range? Uh, well, it, to clarify, the training already occurred in June. So, okay, that accounts for some of the emails I got then. So mm -hmm. this is just for a warrant then for, oh, it is for, it exactly is for a warrant for a training that already happened. Interesting. Why are we voting on it afterward? Yeah. And not beforehand. I can answer to my <laughs> knowledge. Um, so I requested approval for this training last November of 2022. Then Acting Chief Stan Grecki approved it in December of 2022. And I began working with then um, Business Administrator Whitney Nicholson in December, providing her with you know, approval from the chief and necessary materials from that company. Um, I was of the understanding that it was, to clarify that type of, is not, it's out of my purview and knowledge. I, um, I was of the understanding it was cleared. I was informed it was cleared to go. And then afterwards I was informed that I had to come down here for this. All right, well, we'll ask the budget office that question. I can just speak to it. So uh, the department business administrator, who he mentioned, left in, I want to say, May or June. Um, it was never sent to procurement to go through the normal process. Lieutenant Palermo and the academy were not notified that it had not received final approval from OMB, and they proceeded with the training um, without... OMB's knowledge until in them not realizing the procurement process. So that was You do realize council can vote no on this and that vendor won't ever be paid. We do. And that does happen at authorities when contract procedure is not followed. Correct. I don't remember a time that this council that I've been here has done that, but it is an option in front of us. So I advise you not to do that again. I think <laughs> Lieutenant Palermo and other folks at the police we will also be have been talking to our that. budget office and the mayor's budget office, I think, um, as well as uh, you as a public safety director to make sure that the proper procedures are followed. Um, but let me get back to the training. So it already happened. It happened in June, and it did happen at the outdoor firing range. Correct. So I just want to talk about the firing range. <laughs> I knew. <laughs> so I, I had the opportunity. <laughs> and it won't take too much time. We have, have spent a lot of time on this agenda. But I, um, I have noted in the past and i'm grateful to you director schmidt for literally sitting in, with me in your office and calling other ranges in the region trying to find time for our officers to spend some of their training time not in highland park or but you know with the nearest out of highland park um and also um our new police chief when he was being interviewed here i asked him and um he agreed that it would be so much nicer to have an indoor firing range that it would be better for the officers and better um, certainly for the neighborhoods and would be a just more conducive and could be even a, a better situated um firing range we know our local municipalities like mount lebanon have just built new ranges that meet qualification specifications um, and we will continue, I'm sure, to try to d put as many hours as we can at other ranges. Um, and so I'm just kind of reaffirming your commitment to that, Director Schmidt. Yes, it's definitely a commitment. Um, I actually was 
just in an email chain with Director Hornstein and others about our future range um, and making sure that moves forward. And I, I do, as you said, the Chief's very supportive of it. I believe Lieutenant Palermo is supportive. An indoor range would uh, be beneficial to everyone all around, including the officers who then they could manage the weather and not have to work schedules around the weather and that sort of thing. So I appreciate that. Okay, so I just needed to get that on the record every um, because it's still it's an active conversation, um, and um, we I wanted to reaffirm that commitment and just get it on the record one more time. So I uh, look forward to an update. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Firm to recommendation. That takes us to Human Resources Committee, chaired by Councilman Burgess. We have one new paper, Bill 1826. Bill 1826, resolution providing for a professional services agreement with Outwith Studios, LLC, at a cost not to exceed $49,900 to conduct housing discrimination research and development recommendations. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Firms the recommendation. That takes us to Land Use Economic Development Committee, chaired by Councilman Wilson. Do you want these two bills read together, Councilman? Yes, please. Can we read Bill 270 and 465 together? Bill 270, an ordinance amending the Pittsburgh Code of Ordinances, Title VII Business Licensing, Article 10 Rental of Residential Housing, by amending in its entirety Chapter 781, Residential Housing Rental Permit Program. And Bill 465, Ordinance amending the Pittsburgh Code, Title V Traffic, Article 7 Parking, Chapter 549 Residential Parking Permit Program, Statute 549.08 Visitor Permits, Non-Resident Permits, so as to relate the issuance of residential parking permits for the short-term rentals to the issuance of licenses by the Department of Permits, Licenses, and Inspections authorizing the operation of short-term rentals in the City of Pittsburgh. I'd like to um, make a motion to hold for three weeks so that council can have briefings scheduled to understand these bills. Thanks. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The bills will be held three weeks. That takes us to Bill 661. Bill 661, ordinance accepting a new street named Woodring Court in the 23rd Ward of the City of Pittsburgh as per recommendation by the City of Pittsburgh Addressing Committee. The following street name was approved by C. C CPAC in June 2022. The name listed in this ordinance shall be made official in accordance with the Pittsburgh Code, Title IV, Public Places and Property, Chapter 420, Uniform Street Naming and Addressing. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Yeah, I'll just say thanks to all members for uh, allowing me to hold this uh, street name. This was in a, a community that um, I was trying to get the RCO so that they get a CD that they with the developer and uh, they're working on that now. So uh, we're all good to go on this. A little more to that story, but basically I just want to thank all members for uh, allowing me to continually make the holds on this, uh, on this street. Further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Can you oppose? Firm to recommendation. That takes us to bill 1817. Bill 1817, Ordinance Amending the Pittsburgh Code, Title IX, Zoning Code, Article VI, Chapter 919, Signs, to regulate the use of non-advertising signs for major public destination facilities in the RIVNS District. Motion to hold three weeks. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Bill be held three weeks. Bill 1809. Bill 1809, ordinance accepting a new street named Chapel Hill Road in the fourth ward of the City of Pittsburgh as per recommendation by the City of Pittsburgh Addressing Committee. The following street name was approved by CPAC in July 2023. The name listed in this ordinance shall be made official in accordance with the Pittsburgh Code, Title IV, Public Places and Property, Chapter 420, Uniform Street Naming and Addressing. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Affirmative, rec affirmative recommendation. Can we read uh, 1836 and 1837 together? These are both CDBG dollars that Teresa is moving around within her district. 
Bill 1836, resolution further amending resolution number 772 of 2016, effective January 1st, 2017, as amended entitled. Resolution adopting and approving the 2017 capital budget and the 2017 community development block grant program, approving the 2017 through 2022 capital improvement program by reducing Tau Beta Eta Fraternity Inc. as a grant recipient and increasing hope for tomorrow by $3,250 and authorize subsequent agreements. And Bill 1837. Resolution further amending resolution number 840 of 2019, effective January 1st, 2020, as amended entitled. Resolution adopting and approving the 2020 capital budget and the 2020 community development block grant program and the 2020 through 2025 capital improvement program by reducing Sheridan United Methodist Church as a grant recipient and increasing hope for tomorrow by $5,500 and authorize subsequent agreements. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Both bills receive an affirmative recommendation. That takes us to our last committee, Intergovernmental and Educational Affairs Committee, chaired by Councilman Gross. Our first bill is 1553. Bill 1553, resolution adopting plan revision to the City of Pittsburgh's official sewage facilities plan for 32 39th Street, Pittsburgh 15201. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Firms of recommendation. Bill 1554. Bill 1554, resolution adopting plan revision to the City of Pittsburgh's official sewage facilities plan for 166 Banner Way, 9th Ward, Pittsburgh 15201. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion? Sorry, seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Affirmative recommendation. That does exhaust our agenda. We do have meeting announcements this afternoon at 1.30. Council will hold a Cablecast public hearing on Bill 1665 related to fresh food access as a performance point option. Speaker registration closed at noon. And tomorrow, Thursday, August 31st at 10 a.m., Council will hold a Cablecast post agenda to discuss PWSA rate increases in water sewer utilities. Lastly, in observance of Labor Day, City Council will be closed on Tuesday of next week. Council will hold our regular and standing committee meeting at 10 a.m. and 1.30 p.m. respectively on Wednesday, September 6th. To register to speak, please fill out the sign-up form on Council meeting webpage or call the clerk's office at 412-255-2138. Councilwoman Gross. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion for a post agenda on the corporate ownership of housing and residential property wholesalers um, to be held sometime this fall. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We'll work with the clerk to get that scheduled. Councilman Strasberger. Thank you. I wanted to congratulate County Council on the passage of their and unanimous approval of their uh, first climate action plan and also to call for an, a post agenda to review our city's climate action plan and um, uh, progress thus far. So I'll make a motion to call for a post agenda. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Work with the clerk for that as well. Anything else from members? Councilman Warwick. Um, I did just briefly want to um, bring up the uh, the incident uh, with the there, there was a video that circulated on social media last Friday I want to say from last Friday night um, I, I I do not know the details I just know the video that that I saw but there seems there were a number of law enforcement officers uh, subduing uh, someone on the ground uh, I, again I know that there is a an internal inquiry into this and that Chief Scrato is is working on it um, but what really j um, jumped to mind for me was um, you know we were just here at the table not two months ago spend talking about 45 million dollars for body cams and tasers that are specific and you know that, that are specifically intended to uh, enable our law enforcement officers to 
deal with situations from a distance and you know that they are intended to be safer and that there's this body camera footage and so that we have you know we can clearly see what happened etc what happened you know so that we don't necessarily have to rely on 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 our residents um, taking you know taking video from the sidelines um, so I just given that incident it it, it it certainly gave me pause, and I, I, I have questions about why there were took so many officers to sub, to physically subdue one person, um, and I also just in you know I also just want to say that um, for uh, the 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 individual or perhaps individuals uh, who took the video that night, you know that I I, I do want to say that that is very brave right our officers are heavily armed these are scary situations high stress um, for everyone involved so um, I do sort of want to acknowledge um, the individual who stood by in what was a very stressful moment and 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 took the video that being said I don't think that I, it would be nice if given all this money that we are spending on Police cameras. I think that it would be better for, and 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 the pro, and the the proliferation of video everywhere, right? Like everything's on video now. I think it would be beneficial to our residents and also to our law enforcement officers if the video <laughs> that we have from these incidents uh, was was made of was made available. I'm sure there's some legal issues surrounding that, but you know, if 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 there is footage out there, it would be nice to be able to see it and have a full, you know, allow the public and us to have a full understanding um, of what happened. Because certainly from what I saw, um, that was an unfortunate uh, way to handle that incident, to say the least. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cross. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So um, I just re received this uh, during the meeting, and I was asked if I could please read it into the record. Uh, many of you know Officer Christine Luffy. Christine Luffy is truly one of my most favorite people that are on the planet. I've, uh, I don't know that I've ever met anyone that has a bigger heart than, than her in, in just so many ways. And many of you know um, her championing for animal safety and welfare, and, um, and uh, she deals with our most horrific cases of neglect and abuse and abandonment and does that on a daily and regular basis and uh, is a huge advocate for fundraising uh, uh, for um, the health and safety and welfare of animals. Um, she does her biscuit bingo every year. I, I, this past year, I think it was like $70,000 she raised in one day. And I forget, I think it's close to a half a million dollars over the years that she has raised. But <clears throat> she sent this to council and asked that, that I could please read it into the record. She said, Dear Councilman Kraus, I am contacting you as a private citizen. My family and I live in private wooded area in the Beachview community. I have lived in the city of Pittsburgh my entire life, and I have never been more disappointed and ashamed of my city leaders than I am today. I am shocked, heartbroken, and appalled that city leaders would even consider the killing of deer at frickin' Riverview Parks. Please understand that the deer population can be controlled using non-lethal methods. I'm aware that Humane Action Pittsburgh have met with city officials to discuss these methods. Deer are beautiful animals that should be appreciated. They are simply trying to survive in a cruel world we live in. Killing them to control the population is wrong and it is cruel. We need to learn to, how to coexist peacefully with wildlife. Residents in the city of Pittsburgh are subject to violence, drug addiction, crime, Properties that are not cared for, homelessness, mental, mentally ill individuals, garbage, and etc. It seems that officials, uh, it seems that officials to have empathy for people causing severe problems in Pittsburgh, and no mercy for the innocent and defenseless uh, trying to survive. The city of Pittsburgh needs to take a strong stand on the issues that are truly harming our communities. Please try the non-lethal methods that were recommended before resulting to this violence. If this slaughter is passed by city council, I respect, respectfully ask that each member voting in favor be present when they are killed. 
City officials need to witness the cruelty they voted for. Watching an animal die is awful. There will be another way, to, there has to be another way to handle deer population in Pittsburgh. I thank you, Councilman Kraus, for caring about our animals in Pittsburgh. I appreciate your animals. I appreciate your efforts, and I'm sure the animals do as well. So I, I promised I would read her remarks into the record. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Anything else from members? If not, we have a motion to, everyone was present, yeah. Uh, approve the minutes and adjourn the meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. <laughs>